this? I don't know. It's me. It's Amid the Ruins. It's a guy who makes dire wave music. <laughs> it's Amid the Ruins. Dire wave dire music. Wave. music. analysis is the implementation of the AI smart grid and the giant smart cities, which is what IBM talks about publicly building. And that's where we're going. And that's what I think we have to be really concerned about. So all of these tensions, they are part of a long term strategy to basically get everybody moved into mega cities. How's it going? How you guys doing? Uh, come on, don't get pissy. Now we're trying to start the show. <laughs> I perfected my Tony, by the way, as you can see. I have perfected my Tony. Uh, my Polly, it's almost there. I got a little, little bit of ways to go with the Polly, but maybe we can work on our Polly tonight. Welcome, everybody. This is uh, Jay's analysis. We're going to be covering the Sopranos. As you know, long requested, long forgotten. I just avoided it. Not on purpose. It's kind of like X Files. I always wanted to watch X Files, but I never got into it. Yeah. And then I finally did. I'd never seen it either. Yeah. I think I get you in here. You look better than me. I spent an hour and a half trying to get '90s New Jersey woman hair. So she looks like Adriana. And I think that it is witchcraft because I cannot. <laughs> I couldn't do it. This is the best that came out. I don't think they make hairspray like that anymore. No, no come on. You look yeah. you look good. You look yeah. fine. There's no problem. On my life, T. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so before we get going here, thank you. Welcome, everybody. We're going to be covering the entirety of The Sopranos. Uh, the whole thing. I was going to wear my white jacket over this just to be kind of mobster, but... I decided that's a little too... I look like Tony Montana. I don't yeah. look like Tony Soprano. Well, You look like Adriana, though, so that you yeah. work, but yeah. but I look like uh, I look like Tony Montana. Well, that's actually one of the themes in the show, The Sopranos, is that they glamorize their own lifestyle by watching of course. Goodfellas and Godfather and all the mobster movies, um, but the way that they are portrayed in... The Sopranos is that it's not very glamorous. You know, Tony's just like an overweight, balding dude who lives in the suburbs and he's got suburban problems. He wears his bathrobe and he hangs out and eats ice cream at night. He doesn't really live this high-powered, glamorous Yeah. Well, that's a, that's the thing with this show is that it's going to have elements of more realistic mafia type of living and lifestyle at the same time as having a lot of unbelievable elements because as everybody knows uh, there's no way that a actual living existing head of a family or a don would be going to a psychiatrist and telling her all of his problems mm -hmm. uh that would be the end of his career he would be done so that's unbelievable but that's the fantasy fiction element of this is just the, the premise of the show, which is great, which is what if a mobster did actually go to a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and unloaded all of his problems on her? Mm -hmm. You know, what would that be like? What would it what would it be? Um, before we get into this, though, let's step back. Uh, what is your overall impression? So this came out. I'm going to give you my overall impression, then you. Okay. Before we get into the details, this came out uh, starting right at the turn of the millennium. So it's about 98, 99 when the first season starts. So it's a little bit before the big nine event. Uh, it's in many ways, it's, it's interesting to reflect on that time period, right? Right before the big nine event. And this actually comes into the show. Like they bring up the big nine event after it happens. Um, 
it becomes kind of a, a side plot about some of the um, Arab guys in the series who hang out at Badaming. Um, that will play into the final season. But aside from that, a lot of the cultural references, uh, the stuff that Meadow and AJ are into, the pop culture that they're into, the stuff she's presented with at college, the literature that they're reading and reference. Mm -hmm. It was, it was interesting to kind of step back into that time machine to, which I remember vividly. I remember, you know, when nine, nine one, one happened. I remember what was going on at that time. I didn't watch the Sopranos at the time. So I knew about it. I'd heard about it, but it's kind of in the period where I was kind of not really watching TV shows. and. Yeah, I'd never seen one episode either, so it was all fresh, and it's a very interesting transition to have that big event in the TV show because they ha there were scenes that they had to take out because of that. Oh, I didn't know that. In the credits and other um, places in, re in... In relation to the Big Nine event? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. I didn't know that. Now, uh, I want to remind everybody that uh, we do have Super Chats, so welcome. we got 225 nerds. There will be spoilers, by the way, so if you've not watched the full, uh, full uh, series of Sopranos, we will be spoiling it at the end. Uh, maybe then you could tune out, <laughs> but don't tune out right now. So if you do want to support us, you can support through Super Chats, as you know, and we'll be reading those eventually. And let me pull up that link. I know we got our trusty mods in the house. Shout out to the mods. They will be helping with that. But you can ask your Super Chat questions there. But we're going to get into the, all of the different layers and elements, the geopolitical, the historical, uh, the character studies, the archetypes, the uh, literary references, the espionage uh, references that come up, actually. Mm -hmm. The relationship with the FBI, this kind of stuff that all plays into this, this show in a masterful way. So my f initial analysis is that when I started the show, I wasn't sure what I was getting into. I didn't, I didn't know what kind of a show it, it would be. And it's a genre-defying show. It doesn't... It plays on some of the mafia tropes in film, but it also goes in directions you don't expect. It's very comedic. I didn't expect it to be really funny. A lot of the episodes are very comedic. Mm -hmm. Tony is very comedic. The mm -hmm. characters... They're one-liners, they're jokes, they're, they're, you know, making fun of each other. This is all uh, kind of a staple of mafia stuff, but it's played off really well. Some of the episodes are surrealist, which I didn't expect, especially Tony's dream sequences, which I thought were done very well. I didn't expect those in the middle of, uh, you know, really serious mafia stories to have these kind of, you know, surrealist dream sequences with talking fish and this kind of stuff. Well, they had a lot of philosophical questions. Yes, and we will get into that, that too. too. So, um, what's your initial overall uh, assessment? Because it took me all the way through season one to really like it. I was still iffy at the end of season one. By the time I started season two, I was hooked. So, it, it, I didn't initially get hooked. And, but sometimes the shows that you like the best, it, it doesn't initially. You don't get hooked right away. Even songs. Like, the first time you hear a song, maybe you don't like it as much as, you know. Yeah, you it, it was the same for me. We started it, and the first couple episodes, I was thinking, what is the big deal about this show um it almost every show or episode in that season was set in the strip club so it's not really a, a family show <laughs> uh, <laughs> but and then i was thinking well, unless maybe, you're from a prominent strip club lineage or family or I, but <laughs> I, I think that's was one of the draws of it initially is like you don't see a lot of that on tv and so what on TV? The, a, a mafia type Naked kind of story? people on TV. Oh, well, maybe. So. I mean, it's a so to, to let you know, the show is a uh, dramedy, I would argue. It's a, it's a tragedy. It's a, a comedic tragedy is really what this whole series is. Uh, Tony is a tragic figure and in terms of literary There's also analysis. an overarching question in the show is that um, can a psychopath be redeemed or is Tony a psychopath or a sociopath for one and can he help himself for two yeah so we, I think we'll answer that question yes in the show and um I do have some knowledge uh, just cursory of the whole uh, realm of uh, crime syndicates and, and mobsters um it's because it ties into you know espionage research research uh, and so there are different kind of theories and analysis as to, uh, you know, just like with The Godfather, the series is kind of based on 
probably uh, an amalgamation of different families. Um, there's the De Cavalcante family, which is one of the well-known families. Um, as you know or may not know, there's you know the five families. There's other families connected to those families, other syndicates and whatnot connected to Sicilian mafia and so forth. So, uh, you know, you've probably heard of figures like John Gotti or the Colombo family or these kinds of people. So um, this is sort of loosely referencing some of those families. And, and some of the analyses that I read said that they think that Sopranos is based on the Cavalcante because of the waste management. So they actually had a front that was a waste management um, business. That's Tony's business uh, when you start the show. We don't exactly know how uh, Tony is really making all his money. It's not exactly explained that I recall. It says, yes, eventually they're sort of stealing cars. Uh, and then they have that sequence where they go to Italy and they he meets with that uh, hot Italian chick and he tries to sell you know her cars and whatnot. So we know they're stealing cars and shipping them off for another price in Europe. And But there's other things that, that they're doing. We don't exactly know where Tony got his initial wealth because he does live in this pretty nice Jersey house. <laughs> he lives in a house nicer than everybody else, basically. Um, go ahead. Yeah, well, the, the money-making part is not really integral part of the show. It's just kind of in the background of his own psychological dramas and relationships. Right? Yeah, I mean, that's this, as all good stories are, you know, they're not just about crime or, or heists or uh, this is about the character it's about the it's a character study um everybody's character arc is pretty fascinating it's uh you get into the characters uh which it, it's it's not easy to draw an audience into the characters especially when they're bad guys and i think that that's the good point the difficult part of a movie uh and that's probably why mafia movies are successful is because they they're able to the good ones are able to get us to feel sorry for empathize with and understand how somebody comes to be that way and live that kind of a lifestyle yeah he was one of the first kind of anti-heroes um in tv so he kind of paved the way for characters in, um in like breaking bad interesting i never thought about that yeah that's a great point yeah so let's get into where we begin um uh, we see at the beginning, Tony is uh, going to a psychiatrist, as we said. If you watch the famous kind of YouTube videos that are going around of Michael Franzisi, who's the a former uh, a mob boss, I don't remember what family, but, um, you know, he's, he gives an analysis of different uh, mobster movies, and he says that that's the most unbelievable aspect of this whole series is the whole idea of going to, to see a psychiatrist. So, but this is a, a fictional series, so we're going to set that, aside we're going to uh, suspend our <laughs> disbelief for a moment and just figure out what it would be like if this did happen and so what happens is of course um he's immediately kind of at the outset prescribed uh prozac mm -hmm. and the the most important symbolic sequences in season one that are called it's been a while since i did season one but uh is when he sees different animals and the ducks and so the ducks are the most important thing in season one because they're hanging out in the pool and Tony for some reason feels this kind of association and attraction to these ducks. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the connection of the ducks is, except that perhaps they signify an omen because as we know, the series is going to end in a certain way and the ducks never come back. If I, if I recall, unless they're seen maybe at the end of season one, he sees them flying, but they don't come hang out anymore. Right. And there will be multiple animal references, nature references throughout the show where, where we will see the bear kind of wandering into the, the backyard. Um, I've got notes. I don't remember what time The very time last is. episode has a cat. Oh, yeah. yeah the it. cat plays an important role in the, in the, the finale. So the animal sequences uh, basically signify, I think, Tony as a force of nature. Right? Tony is um, a kind of an agent of death. He's an angel of death. And... The other unbelievable suspension of disbelief aspect to the show that we're going to encounter with Tony is that he never loses. He never gets busted. He never gets caught. He, he escapes out of everything. He's He wins, 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 winning, right? All the way until the last season. Then we start to get the intimations, the omens that pop up, the foreshadowing, the, the pre-signifiers that... It's not probably going to go that well for Tony in the final season. Uh, don't forget the horse, right? Tony mm -hmm. has the connection to the horse. So he, he consistently starts 
having these associations and deep connections with animal uh, symbolism, animal forces, the, the, the forces of nature. This is for multiple reasons, but uh, when we get to the end, I'll tell you why I think Tony has this deep connection to, uh, to nature and to animals, because it will all be basically explained in the final season. Um, and a lot of the recurring symbolism, you want to pay attention to this, will be key because as as you watch the series, now looking back, knowing what happens at the end, you can see a lot of the clues that were being laid so that you could understand and interpret the final episode. And in fact, the beginning of season six, the first episode, is the uh, pre-signifier of the final episode. So the, 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 the final season is basically just going to kind of lay it out on the table in a lot of symbolic uh, correspondences and clues. So you're going to know by the final season what's going on here. Um, we got a bunch of people obviously speculating in the chat. So feel free to, uh, to leave your super chats and I'll read those if you want to. But um, So now let's get into it. So the, it's waste management. He's talking to the, uh, to the woman. Uh, this annoying, I can't stand this woman. I, I was the whole time. I was like, please stop going to this annoying psychiatrist. She's the most annoying person in the series next to Janice. Okay. Janice and the psychiatrist. I, I cringe. They're revolting people. I can't stand and them. And the mom. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, fun they're fact, all equal. They're all equal. The actress who played the psychiatrist was supposed to play the wife, but Ugh. she wanted the psychiatrist role instead. Which is interesting because that actress plays Ray Liotta's wife in Goodfellas. So in Goodfellas, she is the mobster's wife. And Actually, that's probably why she was up for that role. Sopranos shares 27 total cast members with Goodfellas. Whoa. So they're very closely linked. And it's interesting to study the mob because the way that they operate is a lot, uh, how the Illuminati operates. Too. Yes, they're uh, another mafia. Exactly. Um, and so the families of the Illuminati, they also fight with each other. They're not all on the same yes. page about everything. Uh, in fact, the big elite, the top of the, the pyramid, uh, is who in the modern period will displace these other families. Right? They will come to be the chief mafia. And really what we're watching in The Sopranos on a big geopolitical scale that I'll get to is that displacement, right? The... The uh, FBI, the CIA, they're mentioned very clearly at the end of the, of the show in, this, in season six. That's the big mafia, the big geopolitical mafia that is essentially going to squeeze out any of these lower, lesser, lesser rival families or mafias. But yes, in the sense of secret societies, structures, the elite are structured in this way. It's just that these families uh, are not going to be at the table in the New World Order. And that's why... Um, we're witnessing with Tony the, the end. That's another reason why, spoiler alert, it's a tragedy. Tony represents the older way of, of doing things. Like even his whole attempt to kind of preserve um, Little Italy or the Italian culture in uh, New Jersey, where he's at, when he doesn't want to sell certain stores to uh, Jamba. Jamba Juice and the big corporate stuff, he wants to, to things to to stay the way that they are, but it doesn't work. Right? Tony is going to be ousted by bigger mobsters. That's the key. Well, here. there is one episode where they go to some kind of Starbucks or something to shake down yeah. them for their neighborhood protection payment. money. Protection, protection money. money. And the guy that works there is like, uh, I can't do anything. I'm just a manager. There's corporate, and they're like, What if we bust your windows? Maybe out? Uh, we got to come by and bust out a few windows. And he's he's like, like, All right, uh, corporate will just replace them. Yeah, they'll just replace me. <laughs> he's like, Maybe we'll uh, let you uh, have a little bit of our fists. And he's like, Yeah. I mean, they're just going to fire me and put somebody else in here, dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, by the way, if you watched uh, Fargo season two, that is the exact same thing in Fargo season two because. The, uh, the black mobster guy, right? If you remember, he goes and threatens that corporation that comes in and the corporation just laughs at him. He's like, he's like maybe I got to come in here and bust a few computers up. And they're like, uh, corporate head office will just send us three new computers the next day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, it's not going to do anything. So, yeah. Who's the bigger gangster, right? Yes. So this is the families getting displaced eventually by the big mafia. And, and the final season will 
kind of make reference to that who that big mafia is. And it's not who you think, right? It's essentially like FBI, CIA type people. That's the big mafia that's going to come into the picture here. And I got a shocker for you. Guess who and why that big mafia displaces this mafia? Well, because there used to be an alliance between these two mafias. <laughs> Did you know that? This is a famous book, famous story. Uh, and in fact, it will be referenced in season six. The, the, the FBI agent will talk to Tony about Tony's families, right? the families connected to Tony that actually helped the allies and protected L L Lucky Luciano and different characters uh, during World War II uh, as a result of uh, alliances between the CIA and the Sicilian Mafia. So this is well known. Uh, there have been many, many times in history where the Mafia and the CIA have linked up. Um, and the problem is that uh, the, the loyalties of the CIA uh, are not the same as the loyalties of the families. And so eventually <laughs> the CIA maf Mafia uh, will screw you over. So that's the meaning of this show, basically, towards the end, on the geopolitical level. But we're, we're going to hold that off until we get to the end. Let's talk about some of the references in Season 1 that I didn't expect. Um, if you remember, uh, there are interactions between um, t uh, Tony's family and the Jewish Mafia. And so there is a hotel that they're kind of uh, squabbling over. And the, the, the Jewish mobster refers to Tony uh, as a golem, which I thought yeah. was a wild sort of Kabbalistic reference because they're sort of orthodox. They look like Hasidic. I guess they're Hasidic Jews that are connected to the Jewish mafia. They had a deal with Tony. It didn't go right. And this is how we see Tony gaining that hotel at the beginning. So the, 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 this, on the mafia level, what Tony is doing throughout the first few seasons is basically acquiring more businesses through mafia tactics. So he gains that hotel. Uh, he burns down Artie's restaurant mm -hmm. uh, and then helps Artie basically rebuild it and uh, ends up eventually with a stake in Artie's restaurant. If you remember Robert Patrick, the T-1000 or 2000, whatever he is, remember? Doggett, Agent Doggett from oh, X-Files. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Doggett is a uh, gambling addict, and so Tony notices, profiles this, Gets him in on this big gambling game, lets him in, but he warns him. He says, I told you, 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 you're not ready for this. This is above you. You're not ready for this game yet. This is a big game here. And, oh, Tony, let me in. Oh, I want to play with the big guys. I want to, I want to. And it's because he's got, uh, uh, who's the famous singer? His son is there playing cards with him. Is Frank Sinatra? Yeah, Frank Sinatra Jr. is literally in the show playing cards with Tony and, Agent Doggett, Robert Patrick, right from X Files, who's just this normie boomer dad. He's like, you know, let me let me in there, Tony. I want to, oh, I want to play poker with uh, Frank so. Sinatra Jr. That sounds awesome. And then he ends up losing everything because he's a gambling addict. So what I'm saying is that Tony is a master profiler, so he knows people's weaknesses mm. and he knows how to get what he wants through people's weaknesses. This is again possibly why you could have the CIA and the mobsters linking up because they have common types of interests. They know how to profile people. They know how to find weaknesses. So he knows Doggett or uh, Robert Patrick, the character has this weakness and he gets him basically to forfeit the entire business that he owns. He owns this giant uh, uh, sporting goods store. And then Tony just comes in and takes it over. Well, you, you owe me this now. This is my store now. Well, that's one of the themes in the show um, is that can he be helped through therapy or is he just a sociopath who is learning tricks to manipulate people better? Yes, this is a key point that I didn't expect and that's not revealed until the end, uh, which is that, yes, um, we're not sure what the therapy is going to do with Tony. And basically, <laughs> it just... Uh, um, it, it falls apart, right? It's just a way for him to, like you said, better become a profiler. Yes. So he learns tactics. He, he, he's learning more about human psychology, yes. not because he wants to be a better person, but because he wants to be better at manipulating people yes. and, and acting like he has feelings. And the way to understand this and the way that you know this is the case is, is when you notice in the later seasons all the references to Tony like a general. Tony sees himself as a soldier. He makes this reference many times. He says, you know, we're soldiers. We're soldiers, okay? This is a war. We're soldiers. We're fighting for our people, for our, for our family. 
he sees himself as a soldier. He's constantly watching war documentaries. He's watching war shows on the History Channel. He's studying generals. If mm-hmm. you notice, he's watching Rommel, right? How they Rommel. They talk about Sun Tzu too. He, it? Tony yeah. references Sun Tzu, and then when Polly and other people start, uh, it's like that is Sun Tzu. Don't you read Sun Tzu? Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, it's Sun Tzu, you idiot. <laughs> yeah. Right? When uh, Christopher and uh, Polly have their rivalry, but. Uh, but yeah, that's because Tony sees himself as a general. And in fact, I'm going to make the argument perhaps that this is a literary reference to the notion of transmigration of souls or um, being reborn, literally reincarnation, because it, any of the great literary works that we typically think of from the Greeks, um, especially somebody like James Joyce and Ulysses, it has the theme of reincarnation. And most of the time, pagan literature does that. It falls back on that. So there are, I think, these kind of subtle references to, is Tony a reincarnated general? And in fact, somebody Mm -hmm. in the chat made a good point that uh, when when Tony's beating up the the Jewish mobster, he's wearing a robe and sandals. He looks like a Roman. Well, remember when he throws away that horse painting and Polly has it repainted? Yes, a general. As a an general. American general. Yeah. And when you probably didn't see the sequence, but there's a sequence when he goes to Italy and he meets with that woman who's the de facto dawn of the family because the dad's old, the hot chick. He has a dream where he's sleeping with her and he's dressed up as a Roman soldier, hmm. a general. Okay. So there's a lot of references to Tony as a warrior, as a general. So and he, even he brings it up. Let's talk about the nihilism for a second because that well, pops up. Or do you want to? Well, I yeah, I do have that on here. But um, so what I did was I went, I went season by season. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's going to be. Can we hold off on that? Yeah. And let's go to. What I also thought would be fun is we could go character by character and do. Uh, a character Psychological study. Psychological. It would be, but the problem is that I did my notes like from season one up. Oh, okay. So what I began to notice in season one was uh, the manipulative ta- tactics of the mother. I mean, Tony's problems do stem from his parents. I mean, that is clear. Yes. So there are going to be psychoanalytical points in the show that are true. Yeah. Um, His mother is a super master narcissist manipulator. Yeah, so at the very beginning, the therapist diagnoses the mother through the stories of Tony that she is borderline narcissist personality. Fun fact about her. Uh, Well, you know, my mother, she was never loving. She she never loved me. She was a really good villain. Uh, She was one of those characters that you love to hate. Um, But the actress actually had cancer throughout the whole time she was filming and she died before her character died and they had to use old footage and cgi to make up the last scenes of her i didn't know that yeah but yes she actually enjoys um torturing and manipulating tony Mm -hmm. uh this is why tony is who he is in part now obviously the dad played a role too but his dad was a philanderer his dad was gone his dad was out partying and doing mob stuff Uh, so the mom was kind of stuck home alone raising the kids and, uh, you know, herself was this sort of just arch manipulator uh, and was just really cruel. The, the cruelty of the mom is kind of overwhelming and, and shocking because she plays up this character of the innocent little granny so mm-hmm. well. She's, she's always appealing to her victim status. Yeah. You put me in that home. You live up there in your palace. This is the and you thing. want me in this home. You don't love oh, me. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the classic, like, old lady narcissist. Like, you don't love me. Right? You don't love me. Yeah. You put me in this home to die alone. And then the her daughter, his sister, kind of inherits that victim mentality. From yes, her. Janice is just as, uh, uh, just as manipulative, but not very good at it. Yeah. <laughs> She's terrible. Yeah. She's not very smart. So Janice, Tony got all the smarts. In fact, I think they referenced one or two times that Tony is believed to have or may have a genius level IQ. So we we know Tony's super, super smart. Janice got nothing. She got no looks. She got no intelligence. She's just a dumb, fat bitch, basically. She does have that Rolling Stones tattoo. She does have a large, uh, yeah, Rolling Stones tattoo on her uh, (laughs) pancake flappy giant breast. Right. 
I can't. She, there's just three characters that are gonna uh, irritate you so bad. It's the mom, Janice. For me, the psychiatrist. I couldn't stand her. Uh, and Richie. Richie will be the the uh, the worst annoyance of villains for the first couple seasons, and he will end up marrying Janice. Ironically. Um. All right. So um, we find out that the mom is the. Um, chief archetype for uh manipulating and traumatizing tony we're even told that tony is traumatized yeah um even to the point where she tries to put a hit on tony yeah she wants to kill tony and tries to get uh, the uh, uncle and to junior kill. yeah junior gets in on it mm -hmm. and uh that's because they're they don't like the they resent the fact that tony is intelligent tony can run things Junior is envious and, and vainglorious. He wants to be the mob boss, but he's kind of incompetent. He's not, he's in a way he's smart and wise, but he's not good at running things. Tony is good at running things. And that's why he fulfills the role perfectly. But Junior resents him for this, his older uncle, mm -hmm. because he's able to run things. And so they just kind of let, Tony's really smart about this. He lets Junior be the figurehead who can take the fall when they get arrested, right? And Junior goes to jail and Tony's fine. And then Junior finally figures out that this is what Tony let him do, which was yeah. kind of genius, actually. I was listening to two psychologists talk about the characters. And they said, actually, Junior exhibits more narcissistic traits than Tony because he cares more what people think about him. And he'll actually kill people just um, so he doesn't have to look bad. That's a good point. Yeah. Remember, if you want to support us, we got a super couple super chats. We got 360 nerds in the chat tonight. Welcome. We knew this was going to be a good show, so maybe we can get up to about 400 pretty soon here. But uh, hopefully, you're enjoying this. Um, there's references to the mom castrating him. I thought this was interesting that that the psychiatrist tells Tony that your mom was a master manipulator. She has helped train you to be who you are. She has emasculated and castrated you. Uh, so she kind of interprets a lot of Tony's delusions and hallucinations in relationship to the trauma that the mom inflicted on him. And I think a lot of that's true. It's just that as we're going to see as the series progresses, this goofy psychiatrist woman's uh, solution, they, they don't work. Like, and and the, the pills, the lithium, mm -hmm. the Prozac. Uh, which is all referenced in season one. This is when Prozac was brand new, right? Mm -hmm. So they're referencing mm -hmm. Tony's on Prozac. He's trying. They don't do anything. This is also the beginning of Big Pharma. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so you've got Prozac, Lithium, Viagra, all of all these referenced. new um, drugs coming out, and they are all being experimented on, right? Yeah. And there's an interesting scene where the psychiatrist says, I think I've done everything I can with you in talk therapy and we need to implement this new phase of your healing or whatever. And he's just not into it because he just likes just talking to her. He thinks that this is going to change him mm -hmm. without him having to do any of the work. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um we begin to see in season one, uh, the mom, the mom is actually the real villain in season one. Um, the other mobsters are, are mad that Tony, they hear about Tony going to the shrink. They laugh about it. The mom says, isn't that a Jewish thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> she says, that's a Jewish racket. All of Any that. Any kind of self-improvement that one of the characters tries to go through the other characters, Make fun of him for it. Remember when right. Christopher tries to get sober yeah, he goes and through they AA, just yeah. mock him continually for it. And anybody who wants to well, this is a up, this is a theme in the show, posted. right? When it's a question of who are you? I mean, are you born to what you are? Are you are you born to fate? Is Tony destined to be Tony? Uh, can they change? And this will come up when. Um, Carmela, Tony's wife, goes to see a Jewish psychiatrist at one point, and then she goes and talks to multiple priests. Yeah. So she tries to unload and kind of get advice for how to handle the, the, these problems, and she's trying to figure out, can someone like Tony change? That will be one of the major themes in the show. Mm -hmm. As you said, we'll be waiting throughout all six seasons, and yeah. we're wondering, okay, is this going to be Tony's downfall? Is this person going to be Tony's downfall? 
is Tony finally going to get what's coming to him or is he still going to somehow miraculously skate around all of this and get away with it? Uh, and is he actually going to start changing? And they, they do a good job with, in a few instances, Tony does do the right thing. He does start changing. He doesn't sleep with the real estate agent, right? He holds off. He, he doesn't cheat in these instances. There's cases where he helps people out. So that's showing that he that, that humanizes him. He's not an all bad guy. He actually has human qualities. After his near-death experience, right? Yes. So the early Tony is um, no mercy, uh, no bone, no jokes, no bone. I mean, he makes jokes, but I'm saying like, you don't joke with Tony. You don't play with Tony. If you cross Tony, you're dead. So he sort of enforces a rule of fear, right? It's a Machiavelli kind of the prince thing where it's better to be feared than loved. So Tony runs on that psychology for the first several seasons and as you pointed out when he almost when he has this near-death experience when he dies uh for for several episodes he's in the hospital on the, in a on a the bed the in the er um he comes back and he's different so he has had a change but is he really changed and that's what we're going to see towards the end i think it's somewhat debatable to a degree uh because he does kind of more and more uh, have a, uh, a better appreciation of people and his family. You know, he says things like, every day is a gift. Now, I come out of the hospital, I realize, I look around, every day is a gift, Janice. Every day is a gift. Uh, and so he, he knows he's still going, I think, eventually to his end. And, uh, and it, that becomes really clear, as we'll see in season six. So we're almost up to, we got 373. Welcome, everybody. Um, so... Uh, Catholicism is interesting in season one. Mm -hmm. It's very much a cultural Catholicism. Yes. Uh, nobody in the series except for the old people. This is interesting. Um, Polly's uh, mom and aunt take their Catholicism seriously. Um, briefly, uh, Janice has a phase of evangelicalism where she's serious, <laughs> right? With that goofy guy who has narcolepsy. Yeah. And, and they have an evangelical praise band. Remember that? And he falls asleep all the time. Mm -hmm. And Tony, Tony's always laughing. He's good. Oh, maybe you bring your friend over. You can wake him up. <laughs> and then he throws peanuts at the guy when he falls asleep yeah. at the turkey dinner. Anyway, so all of that to say that uh, the the way religion is presented in season one and pretty consistently through the rest of the show is that it's just a cultural phenomena. There's not really anyone, even the priest. This was the really interesting fact in season one was that weird priest that you think might be gay and then you think no actually he's hitting on carmella he's not even actually hitting on carmella he's a weirdo who just wants food and recipes he just wants attention that's a good way to put from it from women but he doesn't actually want to cross the boundary to do anything with them yeah so he basically so stays the night with carmella flirts with her all night they cook dinner they drink wine communion all <laughs> they have private communion yeah uh and he leaves like, or, or he falls asleep, right? He doesn't yeah. want to... He's snoring or but something. then there's this funny scene where Carmela tries to bring the priest a, a dish of food. That guy. It's that priest. Yeah, I know. And another woman has already brought him food that day, so she gets all jealous. Remember? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So even their, their religion is uh, a facade. And yeah, it's really, it's just something that you do, you know, it's mm -hmm. just another, and, and Tony kind of sees through that hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's not above asking existential questions. He asks them pretty consistently throughout the series, but he just, he never, he never sees the, uh, the institutional Catholic church as being anything other than kind of a, a ritual or a, a play. Like he kind of makes some jokes about it. Like, oh, come on, either way I know this is a bunch of bullshit. Mm -hmm. And he says stuff like that kind of in passing. It's just another family obligation thing, like going to a funeral yeah. or a wedding. Um, Next up is... Uh, oh, and the other thing, too, that was interesting about the priest was that he's very much a Novus Ordo Vatican II priest because when he gives communion that night he stays over, he actually brings Carmela a book on Buddhism. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he tells her that she needs to start reading on Buddhism mm -hmm. to find spirituality. So just totally, I mean, this was accurate, right? The whole idea of the liberalized clerics of the post-Vatican II Novus Ordo Church. Do you remember that episode with the, the golden hat saint mm -hmm. and the 
fair. So there's another um, example of the mob working together with the, the church. Yeah, this is uh, obliquely referenced. There's no, I mean, if you watch Godfather 3, there's actually a really clear reference to the connection between uh, the Vatican, uh, the mafia, and the CIA, and all these kinds of P2 Lodge and all that comes up really clearly. Because that was actually based on the P2 stuff with uh, John Paul I and his assassination. Uh, here it's not as clear. It's a little, it's more, you know, just again, kind of cultural stuff. And then th that scene is actually really funny because that will play into the fact that there's one character in the show that will survive all of this. And he's really the only one that we think might actually convert. And it's not who you expect, it's Polly. Because oh, yeah. Polly is superstitious. Mm -hmm. They make fun of him for being superstitious throughout the show. He walks in the bada bing and he sees the Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. Remember at the end, the very last episode, he says this. And we get the impression that, it, that it's really just Polly who has repented at the end when he goes and apologizes to his mom. Or to his surrogate mother, I should say. Um, and he was Holy. the he was the one that was really upset about the saint and the hat, that yeah. stupid hat, he, because he thought you know, I mean he's 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 dumb and he's superstitious, mm -hmm. but he's serious and sincere, which yeah. is interesting. Yeah. Things have meaning to Paul. Yeah. Whoa. You don't just do that, T. I swear That's on my life, T. You don't just do that. That's why he gets so messed up when he finds out his mom was actually his aunt and his aunt was his mom. My whole life. It's yeah. been a lie. Yeah. <laughs> I swear, T. My whole life. It's all a lie. And uh, that's... Again, I like the fact that... Spoiler alert. Um, nobody makes it the, through this. Not nobody, but basically of the main character. Spoiler alert. Uh, Polly is, is who... You know, it's kind of like he's the one that, that goes on to... We don't know what he's going to do, but yeah. presumably he's probably going to go to Florida where they were earlier and just kind of retire. I couldn't believe he was the one that made it out alive mm -hmm. of all of them. I like that, in fact, that it wasn't who you thought. You think, Cause, you th and again, spoiler, you think Adriana and Christopher are going to get out. You keep thinking, okay, they're finally going to, you know, he's going to listen to her. She, you know, they're going to be flipped by the FBI. Uh, they're going to get witness relocation. You keep thinking this. They're going to live happily ever after. You keep thinking it and no. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll get to, we'll get to Christopher. Tony. <laughs> Tony. Tony. <laughs> you do a good age, Tony. Tony. <laughs> no, I was doing, do Adriana. Christopher. 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 Yeah. Adriana, I told you. <laughs> um, so the Buddhism book let's see we get down to there was another interesting element I think this is by about season 2 maybe still in season 1 where they start introducing these uh, other con men okay because remember there's an element to Christopher and Tony that's the con man element right so then they bring in these other characters that they interact with like the black preacher and this black preacher if you notice the young one He's a kind of a, a Al Sharpton, um, Jesse Jackson kind of guy. And his dad, who was a, a, another black preacher, was a serious guy. He was serious about his spirituality. But the younger guy, who's the, you know, the, the preacher leading the black guys to strike at the construction site, he's totally fake. <laughs> he's like, oh, hey, man, I'm just in this for the money, right? Mm -hmm. So he's ready to make deals with Tony. And Tony, dollar. He's like, a, yeah, he's like that kind of a black TV preacher guy. But he, but it's all about race and it's all about, you know, uh, um, he's an opportunist. That's mm -hmm. the word I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, and Tony figures that out. He's like, okay, so his dad's serious. I don't want to talk to the dad. He's, you know, another version of con man. He's just an opportunist. And if he's that way, I can buy him off, right? So Tony can profile people to tell when they're sincere, when they're frauds. And he knows that if they're frauds, it's pretty easy to either buy them off or to muscle them into doing what you want. So he, but I like the fact that they introduce this kind of, you know, opportunist fake preacher guy. <clears throat> and he's tied into the union. And he's trying to use the union, and this is funny because the mobsters have used the union for a long time. So it's like you're you're on the wrong territory here. Right? The mob's going to know how to utilize the union mm -hmm. way better than you trying to use the union. And of course, Tony outwits this guy and ends up foiling this movement. And then there's a very similar character 
to the uh, opportunist black preacher who is the Native American spokesman, who's also a kind of a, we get the impression that he's kind of a con man, that he's just leading this um, cultural movement against Columbus Day, right? This becomes a big ordeal for the social justice themes. Yes, social justice themes start coming up about season two, and they want to, two or three, they want to get rid of Columbus Day and because it's offensive to all the, the uh, Native Americans. Mm-hmm. And this uh, uh, leads to a kind of a, a retaliation on the part of Sil, Silvio and Pauly. They're furious about this. They go and like beat up the Native Americans. There's a big, there's a big street fight between uh, the social justice warriors and the Italians. <laughs> they've, all got, they've got flags, like Italian flags out there and they uh, they want to have Columbus Day and all this stuff. And so there's this big street brawl. Uh, and I, I liked all these elements because it was showing you that a lot of this stuff is manipulated. Do you remember when Meadow went to college, she came back a social justice warrior? Yes, this is another great point because it shows that when Meadow goes to college, uh, you know, she's just kind of a teenager. You know, I mean, she's intelligent and she, she early on figures out that her dad is up to something. Like her dad is not on the up and up. He's not really what he presents himself as just a harm. <laughs> I'm just a harmless waste management businessman. I'm just a businessman, right? No, he's more than that. And she figures this out by the time she's in high school. Um, and so we get the impression that Meadow is pretty intelligent. She also will be spared, interestingly. Um, and then when she goes to college, she is brainwashed, initiated into the social justice system. Uh, she decides, it takes her a while to figure out what her career is. She decides, oh, I want to be a lawyer so I can defend the immigrants. Mm-hmm. So they actually show her as adopting these positions uh, because that's her way to rebel against Tony. And she even says this at times, like when her bike gets stolen, right? <laughs> <laughs> and Tony said, oh yeah, who was the guy that stole the bike, huh? What was he? Oh yeah, who was he, right? And so if you know that scene, then you know what happens. I won't say it because of, uh, you know, getting pulled or whatever. But uh, it's a funny sequence. And it, it, the only reason that Meadow is doing these things is to try to rebel against Tony's old ways and his, you know, kind of uh, what she thinks are outdated ways of understanding things. Because Tony's in a sense you could say conservative even though he doesn't really care about ideologies Mm -hmm. it's purely pragmatic right he knows he knows from the streets that people are different you know he's like i know when i'm on the street this guy's different right he drives around he sees a mosque you know these are these guys are different you know they're different that was a part in the story after um the big Mm -hmm. nine event happened um they wrote that in that Tony is now informing to the FBI yes, about Yes, the FBI Aaron. guys. Yeah, they, they well, asked Tony. For, yeah, that's a great point. Um, they they don't make him an official informant, but they ask him, you know, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, if you can, you know, provide us some information on any of these Arab guys that might be hanging around the bottom being. And he does. He does. So not exactly an informant, but uh, a kind of a just a on the down low uh, passing information back and forth, which Tony just sees as uh, advantageous to himself for getting out of uh, you know sticky situations. So, <clears throat> so moving on, um, I like the sequence when he goes to to Italy uh, to meet up with one of the Dons in Sicily, and as we as I said, we find out that it's it's the Don is actually. Uh, uh, has dementia he's out of it he doesn't know what's going on and his daughter is running things and she's you know the bomb supermodel so tony's immediately sort of smitten by her uh has the dream where he's a, a roman general uh sleeping with her and then the most important sequence in all this is that they go up on this mountain to the sibylline oracle right so they go in this cave where the sibylline oracle used to sit and she the in you know, the oracle would would breathe in the hallucinogen, uh, hallucinogenic gases or whatever, and would prophesy. Uh, and if you don't know, you know, the sibling Oracle is famous for also having prophetic statements about Christ, right? This is a, a well-known thing. If you look up Virgil's in, uh, uh, Ecologue, uh, if you look up the Sybil, there were these pagan predictions also that related to Christ. I think the, the sibling Oracle is even painted, I think, into the Sistine Chapel. 
But the the, the but the the woman the, the woman Dawn tells Tony she says you you are your own worst enemy. So she does this Sibylline prophecy at the Sibylline Oracle about Tony and they even reference this. And then when Tony goes back to his psychiatrist he's like he's like oh, you ever heard of this uh, the Sibyls? The Sibyls. She's like the Sibyls? Yeah, you know the Sibyls the with the, 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 the prophecies. You know, they would they would sit and uh, breathe in his head. It would uh, you know make him prophesy or whatever, right? And so he basically has been told his fortune from the Sybil. I thought that was genius the way they did that, the way they pulled it off. And if you're not familiar with classical lit, one of the things I studied in grad school, you wouldn't catch those references to the Sybil. What do you think? Do you remember when we were watching it and I told you that when he went to see the Sybil, she's functioning like the Sybil. She's telling him his future. Yeah. And he, she said, you're your own worst enemy. And I said, he will be his downfall. It's a tragic, it's a tragedy. Yeah, because Tony's navigating such a minefield with his job and his family and everything that you're constantly wondering who is going to betray him or get him in trouble or like... We're always guessing, is it so-and-so going to be the downfall of Tony? But it's Tony. in the end, it's himself. Mm-hmm. And it's also not what we expect. What ends up being his downfall is not who we think it is. It's a, it's kind of a, a random forgotten dude you know, that he screwed over is basically who ends up being the cause of his downfall. It's not one of the sort of key players that you, that you think it's going to be. Mm-hmm. It's not the FBI. It's not the CIA. No. It's not any of these big agencies or, or forces. It's not the family even. It's not even his family that, that's his downfall. So, um, I like the episode where they're having to deal with the rappers who. Well, before what, we get to that, um, there was a there's a really fascinating sequence. We should probably go back and watch it now that we've seen the end. But there's the sequence of the Wizard of Oz. Uh, this could have an MK Ultra mind control aspect to it because. Um, it has to do with Tony having a car wreck, uh, and it's when it's when Tony was having his blackouts. Mm-hmm. And there's a there's a you may have missed this this episode, but um, the psychiatrist is talking about the psyche. She hears the Wizard of Oz song, and we see this vision. I think it's her vision, if I recall, and she sees Tony dead. She sees him in a car wreck dead. Now, mm-hmm. Tony doesn't die in a car wreck, but it's another instance of the foreshadowing that's going to tell us what happens. And if you haven't seen the end, then you don't know the significance. You're not going to know until the very end what the significance of it throughout the whole series. Tony's son is just a, an idiot. And this mm-hmm. this one sequence where, where the, even the idiot can have this kind of sage, sagacious moment where he says, you guys are all living in a dream. This is not yeah, real. Yeah. Right. And so, again, hearkening back to the psychiatrist dream of Tony and the Wizard of Oz playing and Tony wrecking. Go ahead. Um, I don't remember that one. So, let's see. Um, that's not really relevant. Let's go down here. Cat. Okay, so... Uh, one interesting reference that the psychiatrist will make early on is to Carlos Castaneda. She will talk about reading Carlos Castaneda, and we don't really know at the beginning why that would matter. It could have reference to you know the CIA MK Ultra stuff, which is loosely there with the big pharma, the Wizard of Oz theme, to- uh, Tony being traumatized, Tony blacking out at times. Um, but she will talk about, hey, you should, you know, read uh, Cast- Castaneda, blah, blah, blah. She mentions it in passing. But this is foreshadowing for the end of the show where Tony goes and trips trips out. Mm-hmm. So he actually has this Carlos Castaneda moment where mm-hmm. he goes and does, what does he do? Psilocybin or um, something. Peyote. Peyote. He goes yeah. and does peyote in Las Vegas. Yeah. So that was another um, foreshadowing that you don't. You know, you don't know why it's relevant until you, you get to the end of the, se- to the to the last season. Mm-hmm. Basically, the last season really shows everything. So what's up? We got four hundred nerds tonight. If you would be sure and smash like the gabagool. What's the word of gabagool, huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, you read all of this uh, from one instance of gabagool when I was a kid, right? This is what he tells the psychiatrist yeah. when she's like, 
you have a problem with sexuality and meat <laughs> and, and raw meat. Uh, you read all this from uh, Gabagoo? Yeah. Just because I wanted one inch of snack of Gabagoo, you read all of this? This is crazy. Well, because the Gabagoo has to do with the first time he ever saw his dad kill somebody. Yes, and uh, sexuality. Mm -hmm. Because he says that the weird mom would be turned on when the dad would bring home the Gabagoo because the mom knew that he had killed somebody Mm -hmm. or had done something. Or got the Gabagoo for free because they were... Leaning on the butcher, or exactly. Like that. That's so right. The mom liked the violence and the danger. Yeah, exactly. Turned her on. And Tony was young and didn't understand this. He didn't understand what was going on, and it traumatized him. And that's the first time Tony passes out. Remember? Yes. Remember his uh, episodes? Yeah. And then AJ has these exact same episodes. Do your AJ. Uh-huh. <laughs> what are gutters? What's a gutter? <laughs> uh, you know what? When you two, we're going to clean out your mouth, and then after this, you're going to go clean the gutters. What are gutters? Oh, you're going to get smart with me now. You're going to talk about what a gutter is? You're going to get smart with me? No, I really don't know what gutters are. <laughs> <laughs> He's really that dumb. He actually doesn't know what gutters are. What was the best line of AJ when he said... Yeah, and after this, you're going to go do your homework, and then you're going to study for your tests. Then he, uh, he's, then he says something, something like, his grades, he's like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that I look at your grades. You just showed your own ignorance. because You just revealed your own ignorance because we don't even have grades yet. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a nihilistic teen thing to say. Like, it is, yeah. This is the next thing on my list, actually, is after the Carlos Castaneda reference, we start getting AJ asking questions, right? AJ is this nerdy, chunky little kid who totally oblivious. He has no clue what's going on. And then... Ironically, in the midst of being a total idiot, AJ starts asking like mega big level existential questions. And this is peaked because the grandma is dying, the manipulative psycho grandma. Mm -hmm. And she gets, she tries to turn everybody on her side, right? This is every sequence with the grandmother in season one. She's manipulating somebody to turn them on to, to be on her side. And she gets AJ in there alone and she says, Something about, we all die alone. Mm-hmm. Right? And so AJ's sitting there freaking out with his, he's always doing this. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, he's, and so then he starts thinking, maybe there's no God. Right? And so he goes <laughs> through this existential teen crisis. Um, he starts reading Nietzsche. All that stuff is, is pretty funny. One he's, of the kids He talks about show, existentialism, yeah. One of the kids in that show, his dad gets killed and he turns totally goth with the whole black lipstick and everything you remember that right so this is um Vito later on Vito one of the guys that works for Tony uh Vito turns out to be gay and then he doesn't want to get found out but so he runs off Mm -hmm. so he goes off to another city uh in the Hamptons or somewhere New Hampshire yeah and uh Vito's son starts going through a crisis like AJ did and turns goth (laughs) so he just turns into this total goth guy I won't say what he says to Tony but he has some really funny lines about well, actually, I could see Tony's like, I've been talking to your uncle. Oh, yeah, is he your butt buddy? <laughs> right? And said, uh, uh, yeah, that's really funny. I like you. You, you got a mouth on you, kid. Um, but yeah, so he goes through that same crisis that AJ goes through in the early seasons. But um, AJ's crisis of faith leads him to reading Nietzsche, Sartre, and Kierkegaard. He immediately goes to the existentialist. Um, and that's. It's not super significant, except that it's telling us that the show is going to be asking big existential questions, right? So Tony, uh, Carmela, uh, even Polly, even some of the minor characters are all going to be confronting the reality of life, death, and the afterlife. They're all going to be confronting these questions, and that's why the big existentialist philosophers come up early in season one and two. But it's funny that... It's a bit of irony there that it's the dumbest guy, the dumbest character in the whole show. I mean, you could argue AJ's even dumber than Janice, really, mm-hmm. who actually asks the big questions. Mm-hmm. It's not the smartest, pe- except, except Tony does. Tony asks big questions. And know, the he's big the one question. that sees through all the bull crap. Like, you guys are just dreaming. Well, he and Meadow do. Yeah, Meadow yeah. and he both do. But, yeah. um, all right, let's well, we hit We hit 400, we got 403. Welcome, everybody. Be sure and hit, yes, uh, hit uh, like and share. 
Uh, listen, if you don't hit the like and the share, I'm going to take you out back. I'm going to make sure that you hit the like and the share, okay? <laughs> All right, so we're done with this. Hell is three o'clock in the near-death experience vision. So there's a near-death experience vision early on, a hell vision. I don't know what my note's about, but something to do with... Tony starts describing a dream or a vision, and he talks about how the... the psychiatrist woman asks him, like, what do you think your dream means? I don't know. I, I'm not going to hell. Hell's for the worst people. You know, that's for the, right. the, the rapers and the murderers and, the, you know, all the people that do all the really nasty shit. Yeah. I'm not going to hell. Come on. That, that's interesting that Tony doesn't see himself in the category of a bad person. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I also liked the element where Tony gets neighbors, and the neighbors that he gets are these uh, a really annoying, snooty wasp elite and then that's one of the, actually the funniest sequences in the whole show is when the wasp elite who are into stocks, and this is how Tony and Carmela start getting into stocks. Uh, they take Tony out to, to play golf. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Remember that? And they're like, so, uh, uh, maybe, you know, some stories about, uh, John Gotti, you could tell us. And Tony's like, uh, what are you talking about? Who? What? Yeah. You know, have you heard any stories about, you know, any of the famous guys? And then Tony realizes that they know that he's in the mafia and they, they think that there's all these you know stereotypes. And so Tony tells them this whole ridiculous story with a ridiculous ending. So the moral of the story is John Gotti really liked ice cream. <laughs> he just tells them this nonsense story and they're all like... Oh, yeah. Huh? And so he's just messing with them, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was, that was a good comedic twist because you think that Tony's going to take that golf club and start beating the crap out of him. Yeah. And he just makes fun of him. It's, yeah. it, it was great. But the wasp elite, right. They, um, use the Italian immigrants and this actually comes up, you know, he, Tony references this about how, uh, you know, we used to, we, we used to work for them, right? We would have, we would have grunts for them. You know, no, we, we, we did our, where's our stuff? You know, where's our uh, uh, place at the table, right? So it's all about wanting a place at the table the different uh, wealthy power structures, right? The J.P. Morgans, the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, the Wasp elite mm -hmm. who use the Italian immigrants as the workforce. And this is why Tony, and I think it's Tony that says this, uh, where's our piece? We want a piece of this. Mm -hmm. I think he's telling it to the psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. He's explaining the Italian immigrant experience, mm -hmm. right? He's saying, like, this is this is our people. This we is built us. This. We built this place. Yeah. We built this country, right? For them. And so... He doesn't care for that, you know, snooty, uh, arrogant Wall Street wasp elite. But they do get the idea from the wasp elite to set up a, this little stupid stock scam. And they put Christopher in charge of it, which is hilarious because Christopher brings in uh, his two uh, muscle guys who are also complete idiots. Mm -hmm. Right? They end up getting killed the next season because they're so that's stupid. That's another point about this show is um, the criminals aren't that smart. Yes. Um, even the, the guys that Tony has as his conciliere or his right-hand men, mm -hmm. they're not that bright. Mm -hmm. um, even, the other his... even the other bosses of the family, right? Johnny Sack Jr., he's yeah. incompetent. He can't run the family. Um, no, 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 not, not Johnny Sack. Um, it's the guy that Johnny Sack's in a, a rivalry with. Um, the other guy. What's his name? Somebody Jr., the... the the old guy that dies, and then the, the his son takes over. Oh, yeah, I remember. Um, he's the guy that makes the movie with Christopher. That guy, he's funny. Little Carmine, thank you. Yeah, Little Carmine is incompetent. Uh, Johnny Sack is kind of competent. He can run things, but even he can't really... He's no match for Tony. Nobody is a match for Tony. Um, even though the other families are jealous of Tony and they'll diss him, they're they're afraid of Tony. <laughs> they, don't, they don't know how to handle him because you can't. Tony's a force of nature. You can't really deal with this guy. He's unstoppable. Mm -hmm. um, we mentioned Richie and these different characters who are kind of the key villains. I mean, Richie is just on. He, he you can't. He's like Joffrey, right? Richie, the grandmother. These, these are Joffrey level characters. You can't wait for them to die. Mm -hmm. um, but the the only reason Richie is really interesting as a character is the clue of the jacket. If you remember, uh, 
Richie, who himself is totally a psychopath, he kind of wants to impress Tony. Even though he resents him and fears him at the same time, he's the guy that ends up marrying Janice. He, he thinks maybe I can win Tony over by giving him some kind of symbolic thing that in his mind is important, which is a stupid 70s jacket. It's this hideous, ugly, you know, 1975 leather jacket. And he gives it to Tony and Tony's like, uh, what is this? Uh, okay, yeah, put it in the trunk. And then Tony just gives it away. <laughs> and then Richie sees the jacket that he gave to Tony, which had the significance for him, given away. And he's just infuriated, right? So you know in season two or three that there's going to be this, you know, butting of heads between uh, Tony and Richie. But the reason that the jacket is so important is that the jacket is going to be the key clue at the end of the show telling you what really happened, right? Mm -hmm. The jacket. Not that jacket, just the jacket. Just keep jacket in mind. It's just telling you a clue. That jacket's insignificant, but it's just calling your attention to details in the show like the jacket that are going to be important for uh, deciphering and decoding the final episode. Uh, <clears throat> of course, as you know, uh, I like the fact that um, it wasn't Tony that killed Richie all of this time. There's the, the, the Tony and Richie butt heads about five times and you're just waiting for Tony to unleash on this guy. Mm -hmm. And he ends up not doing it and you think, well, okay, now he can't because uh, Richie's married to Janice. Mm-hmm. And then who ends up getting rid of Richie? Janice. Yeah. Because Janice is just as crazy and psycho as Tony. <laughs> but she's she doesn't have any self-control. Right. And so she just does it, loses her mind. Tony, uh, help me. Tony has to come over. He's the fixer. He cleans it all up. And he gives her a bus pass and says, now you're out of here. Get lost. I don't want to see you again. Yeah. And, uh. Because Janice really was just, a, she's just a mooch, right? She's, she's a, her life is a failure. She can't find a relationship. She's overweight. She's uh, unpleasant as a person. She's really annoying. She tries to be manipulative, but everybody can see through it. Mm -hmm. She's just a terrible person and a terrible character. And so Tony just wants to get rid of her. And so he thinks finally he's going to get rid of her. Of course, she's going to come back. Um, but as we end the early, uh, about getting almost to the middle, midway of the show, um, we see the important vision of a uh, dream that Tony has. And I like that they couch this vision and dream in the midst of a really uh, um, base, guttural, potty humor element when Tony gets diarrhea. Oh, yeah. And because yeah, but it's but it's on purpose to contrast it with it's it's a it's a it's a kind of a, a contrast. It's a literary usage of the grotesque, mm -hmm. where you take something that would be a profound vision, and you couch it in something ridiculous like farting all night with diarrhea mm -hmm. because you had bad seafood. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Tony is goes and has uh, Artie's I don't know what shrimp or something, and this the shrimp is bad, and it gives him this awful case of food poisoning. And we both had food poisoning. We, we can sympathize with this. We were just remembering what it was like to have food poisoning. Mm -hmm. It's awful if you've never had it. It's, it's, you think you're dying. And so in the midst of this food poisoning, Tony has these prophetic, really deep visions. He sees the future, a potential future, and the future. And he sees, in a way, kind of his own demise. Um, and he sees... He doesn't know how to interpret it yet, but he sees and he senses deep down who the rat is. That's when he figures out who's betraying him. It's Pussy. Yeah. So Pussy is the rat. Um, he doesn't immediately know how to interpret the dream because he's walking down the, the boardwalk uh, by, the, by the beach and he sees these fish for sale and the fish starts talking to him and it's Pussy. Um, and what does it mean? Yeah, he sleeps with the fishes. So he's seeing what is going to happen, what he's going to do when he finds out, uh, which he kind of deep down knows, that is Pussy's the rat. Pussy's going to have to go sleep with the fishes. I really like that, though, that they couched the, the, the profound, you know, prophetic visions in the midst of this guttural, you know, bloating and, and gas sequence that's really kind of hilarious. Um, so once again... Uh, 
Tony is not just a um, uh, a general. He's almost a kind of a king. And, and if you know from scripture and from the ancient classical literary tradition, kings were oftentimes seen as prophetic characters. Uh, the, the dream that the king has, Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, right? Pharaoh's dreams. Kings were believed to have prophetic dreams. And so Tony also has this kingly type of role and so he is having prophetic dreams, but at the same time, he doesn't know how to interpret that. It's just so foreign to his kind of pragmatic mind. But eventually he's going to start figuring out that, you know, a lot of what's been happening to him was kind of synchronicity manifesting, archetypal relationships manifesting to tell him that that he's actually seeing the future. Mm-hmm. What do you think? I mean, don't you see that there's these esoteric things that keep coming up, these passing references? Yeah. Even the literary, and there will even be esoteric and occult references later on. Yeah, and another thing about him being the king is he always has to watch his back because somebody's yes, because of treachery, step up treachery, and take his position. Yeah, if you're at the top of the, the heap, everybody yeah. wants to take you down. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, you know Caesar, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, at two brute, right? Yeah. And so in that way, he ends up having to kill a lot of the people who are loyal to him and who he's supposed to be sworn to be protecting in this brotherhood. Tony, I think, throughout the whole of the show, he kills more of his loved ones than he does of his enemies. Yes. Well, this is one of the tragic... This is part of the reason why Tony is a tragic character is that, I mean, the role of being a king... um, or the head of an, an army, so to speak, is that everybody below you, it resents you. Um, they don't trust your leadership. They want to take you down. They want to see you fall. They want to see you fail. And so what Tony, and this even comes up, I think it's season three or four, where uh, there's almost a kind of a mutiny, right? Polly re- resents Tony. Even Sal at one point kind of resents and criticizes Tony and is mad at him. Christopher resents and is mad at Tony. And so do even some of the other uh, underlings. And Tony has this sit down meeting, I think with, with Sal or Polly. And, and he basically just says, you don't know what it is to be in my position. He's like, I, I have to deal with stuff that I can already read you and tell you that you can't handle this. Mm-hmm. And that's how he's so successful against all of his enemies and against Johnny Sack, his main rival towards the, the later seasons is that he can already tell that they can't put up with it. They can't deal with what he deals with. So it takes, you almost feel like it takes a kind of personality like Tony to handle what he does. And it's, it's not just IQ. It also requires this kind of like, um, you have to be like a general almost is what I'm trying to say. They did such a good job, um, or he, the actor did throughout the entire series, um, starting off as like the second in command under Junior. Mm. to becoming this really frightening character like he gains weight he gets meaner he gets nastier he gets darker Mm. um the way that he walks changes the way that he talks changes it's just he becomes more of a, a monster mobster as the show goes on yeah, no, they, they intentionally are making him more like a bear. Like yeah. a, a, That's why that bear comes out of the woods randomly. And uh, Carmela and AJ are afraid of it. They start freaking out. But that's because it's the real fear is Tony. They're, yeah. they're afraid of the monster, the bear that Tony's turning into. Because in the beginning, you think he's a teddy bear. But then at, by the end, he's a big fat grizzly bear. Right. right? Yeah, I, uh, let's see what my next note was. Um by the way, those the sequences where you see Tony, um, you'll notice the show uh, episodes will constantly open with Tony lying there in the bed, uh, and then maybe one eye will open up, uh, or you'll see him kind of like with his hair all messed up. Uh, all of those sequences of him lying there in the bed are foreshadowing. They're telling you what the show is going to show you at the end, because what is sleep? It's a form of death. Okay. 
So those are all versions of foreshadowing. We're watching the transformation of Tony. Like you said, he just, he kind of grows into this sort of bloated kind of like, he just sort of waddles around mm -hmm. and he, he walks around like a, 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 um, like a degenerate king. And that's kind yes. of what he becomes yes. because he can't lose. That's what's so surprising about this character is that, you know, when you're watching any other mob movie, you keep, just keep waiting and you know uh, when, you know, Scarface, you know his moment's coming, right? He's sitting there with a giant pile of cocaine and he's got the machine gun and, you know, the feds are coming in. He's done for. Or the other monster, whoever it is that comes and takes him down. You know he's at his end. Uh, that's a tragedy. Um, how's Goodfellas end? Does, a, does Ray Liotta get killed or does he? I can't remember what happens. Right. Anyway, but, you, you know, you eventually know these characters are going to go down. And you're just waiting the whole se the whole show, and Tony, no, nothing happens to Tony that's bad, really. Uh, even when the FBI, the FBI keeps making these moves, and you keep, oh, now they've got the bug in the basement, they're going to get him. Mm -hmm. And then Meadow takes the lamp <laughs> to college. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the, they spent this whole, like, three, and, three episodes just trying to get this bug in Tony's it's, basement. It's, a lot of it is through no conniving of his own it's just like dumb luck that it's he no it's fate it's it's fate yeah, he's it's fated fate. to be this general this king that's unstoppable he's an unstoppable force until he himself is his own undoing and that's mm -hmm. the whole point of this tragedy is that so the fbi moves against him with the, the surveillance um and then other people start taking medication uh this was an interesting point um other people are talking about taking medicines lithium prozac all this kind of stuff it doesn't help anybody um, Adriana, doesn't Adriana start taking something? She got irritable bowel syndrome. But, right, but her and, and Christopher get hooked on heroin, remember? Yeah. They have a whole season of being heroin addicts, and mm -hmm. this is what prompts Christopher to go into rehab. And, and really, Christopher is who Tony is grooming to be the number two. He wants yeah. Christopher to run things. He thinks Christopher's the best potential candidate. Yeah. Because he's family, he's uh, Carmela's cousin. In in essence, he's the son that Tony, you know, that, that AJ, that AJ is not. isn't right. Yeah. And and Christopher is a weird mix because he's dumb and smart at the same time, mm -hmm. right? He's ironically really talented. If you remember when he goes and takes acting lessons, he blows everyone away at how good he is at acting. I mean, he even brings the acting class to tears. They they can't believe it, but he's also unstable and then somebody in acting says something to him that he takes serious and he knocks the guy out so it's <laughs> like he just like he could have been a, an excellent amazing actor and he just runs out of there because some guy made a joke in the midst of acting so you can tell that christopher himself is unstable um there's mention of christopher's life and how he was kind of raised by a single mom and his mom was a drunk uh, that actually comes up so so he didn't have a good parenting. Um, this is part of the reason reason why Christopher has fallen into this life of being a gangster. Um, and there's a couple times that this is what I like with Christopher is that there's a couple times where you think, wow, he's actually going to be, you know, the guy that takes over after Tony. Um, he's going to be running things, right? T Tony eventually promotes him to basically number two. But Christopher himself is his own worst enemy, right? Christopher ends up to deal with his his uh, guilt and pain. He ends up on heroin. Mm -hmm. um, this almost destroys his relationship with Adriana, who's the best thing to have in him. Mm -hmm. She is the one that actually tries to get him out of that life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not intentionally. Well, actually, at the beginning, she kind of wants him to get out of it. She's worried he's going to get killed. But then, just like with Carmela, when she starts noticing all the fancy shoes... The Gucci Prada diamonds that come from this lifestyle, and this is the the key the key reason why, in many ways, Carmela is more of a hypocrite than other people, is that Carmela knows what's going on, mm -hmm. but she hides behind this. I'm a wife, you know. I'm a wife. I I'm don't know. Pray for him. Uh, yeah, right? she hides yeah. behind all this piety. Yeah, but Tony actually can call her out because he knows that she's only doing all this because she also likes the big diamonds the big house the prestige know. of being the first lady of the mob family well and yeah. and the, the the fancy the shoes yeah. the house and all the all, all the goodies it, yeah 
And so she even admits that when she's either talking to the psychiatrist or the other priest and uh, she has this gigantic diamond on and then she hides it Mm -hmm. (laughs) because the priest or the psychiatrist is like, "Mm, well, uh, you seem to be uh, benefiting from this lifestyle. Maybe that's why you don't want to get out of it. And she's kind of like, she's confronted with her own hypocrisy, but she doesn't, she kind of counts the cost. And then we have that season where briefly they split up. And, you know, she goes and finds the, the money in the bird feeder that Tony had hidden, the $40,000 there. She goes and invests it. She wants to, you know, invest in these uh, development projects, this house that she has built. Because she knows, as Tony has said throughout the show, um, uh, the life of a mobster is 80% you're in the can. Or what, what is it? Uh, uh, you either, you're either in the can or you're dead. Right. You're, you're either on the morgue table or you're in the prison. Mm-hmm. So Carmela knows this. She's basically just worried about her own survival and the kids. But even her character is a, a tremendous, she's a tremendous hypocrite because she's always hiding, just like the grandmother, behind this facade of, I'm doing this for the kids. I'm doing this for the family. Mm-hmm. But if she really loved the family, would she have them in this lifestyle? No. Well, that's another um, question about Tony. Is he a psychopath or a sociopath or what? Um, because you, you think he's doing this for his family. He's, he has to murder people or they'll come murder his family. Yeah, and there's also, I mean, and, and we know Tony's a philanderer. He's very open. It's, it's, it's pretty open. Well, they all are. Well, it's but what I'm saying is that, that there's an interesting sequence where she falls in love with Furio, this mm-hmm. other, you know, goofy, you know, ponytail guy with the, <laughs> the wild, crazy shirts that he wears. She uh, has this this affair with, with uh, Furio in her mind. Yeah. Uh, and But she never actually acts on it because Furio is, like, terrified of Tony, yeah. right? Yeah. And Tony, uh, there's a hilarious thing where he calls her out on this. He's like, oh, you mad at my philandering, huh? You mad at me sleeping around? Oh, what about you and Furio, huh? What about you and Furio? Tony, it never happened. I never slept with Furio, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter because uh, the whole point is that she wanted to, right? She wanted that. And, you know, like Jesus says, if you're committing adultery in your heart, committing adultery. So Tony's really just kind of a more honest character. It's not that he's good, uh, but it's that he's more honest, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, because she is kind of the moral compass of the show. You think. You think. But then her actions are, like you said, she's hypocritical. Um, She takes him back when she shouldn't take him back, you know. She likes the the riches. Yeah, she is. um, She loves the, the glamour and the money and the wealth more than she loves the truth of what it would cost to actually get the family out of that lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Because if she really loved her kids, I mean, she has to know that that lifestyle is dangerous. She's always harping at Tony about how dangerous it is and what he's, the situation he's putting them in. Well, doesn't she know that the kids are susceptible to this danger with this lifestyle? So why is she not running to the FBI? And in fact, when she goes to the psychiatrist and the other priest, they basically tell her this. And she's like, well, I, you know, ooh, I don't know if I really want to, you know, count the cost to get out of this lifestyle because in a lot of ways it's really easy and it's really nice. So uh, fr- from a character study perspective of Carmela, uh, I think that she is, for a lot of people, hard to stomach because she's really hypocritical. Mm-hmm. And it's not that, s- that some of the uh, moral criticisms she makes aren't correct. It's that she doesn't. She hides behind the piety, I think, is what makes yeah. people really She's mad about hypocritical her. hypocritical, and she has no backbone when it comes to standing up to him. Because Tony knows her weakness. Yeah. Remember when he makes her really mad? What is it? He goes and buys her this big diamond necklace. Because she found him cheating, so he he buys her that. Yeah, but he, know, but he knows her weakness. Yeah. Which is, yeah. you know, jewels and stuff. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on as we get to, uh, we need to, how long have we been going for... Not too bad, hour and a half. So hopefully we can keep this to about two hours, maybe. There's an interesting sequence where AJ sees the dead. Um, when Tony's mom eventually does die, um, ghosts appear. 
uh, there's a sequence where um, Tony or somebody sees pussy in a mirror. Um, AJ sees the grandmother in the hallway. Mm -hmm. Remember? So we're starting to see that there's flashes of the dead being seen. Right. Well, not only that, but when the AJ sees the grandma, that's the beginning of his traumatic episode, his panic attacks, oh. like Tony. So the grandma has affected Tony with the panic attacks, and then again to the grandson AJ with the panic attacks. Yes, because as you put here, your note is good. You said um, AJ sees the ghost of the grandmother, and this is the beginning of his trauma, like Tony with the devil ghoul. Mm-hmm. Then we have the very interesting reference um, by the Jewish psychologist to uh, Carmela when she goes. He says, have you read Crime and Punishment? And Crime and Punishment is great because it's in many ways, it's very similar to the story of The Sopranos. You have, um, is it Raskolnikov is the main character who has murdered somebody because he overhears stories of great men. And he thinks, well, if the great men of the world, like Napoleon and different generals, you know, basically just killed whoever they wanted to to become great men, why don't I just kill somebody and become a great man? I mean, everybody else seems to do this in history, so why not me? And then, as you know, if you've read Crime and Punishment, the rest of the book is basically Raskolnikov dealing with the guilt of what he did and only finding redemption at the end of his life through Sophia, who represents grace and wisdom, the girl who ended up being the prostitute who's the one that the only one that truly loves him right she keeps visiting him while he's in the work uh prison camp for murder and then finally at the end he repents right so um you think that so that in other words the reason that the psychiatrist recommended to carmela to to re-crime and punishment is because he sees her as a character like perhaps a sophia or like even uh, a Raskolnikov in the sense that she's guilty for being part of this. And so he's recommending that book to her to, to, for maybe for her to repent or to come out of this life, because that's what he tells her. The priest basically says the same thing to you. You need to get out of this life. It's not going to, it's not going to be in well for you. And this is another reason why um, it is. Tr I think it's true at the end that Carmela is also killed hmm. because she doesn't heed the warnings. Mm -hmm. She stays in the life they're constantly warned. The dead are appearing to them oh. to tell them that this will lead to your death. Well, throughout the show, most of them have a moment where they could get out, but they stay in, and then that leads to their death. Correct. They, they have an out. Uh, mm -hmm. Multiple times, in fact. Yeah. Um, all of them, really. I mean, yeah. it's, it may be, except for Tony... Although I guess, you know, conceivably, if, if they wanted, wanted to, to, Tony could just fly off the, you know, to an island somewhere if he wanted to, I guess. But, but the day that Adriana died, she could have chosen to leave and go into witness protection, but she chose the lie and to go to... Well, uh, well, no, actually, well, Christopher made a choice and Adriana made a choice. Mm -hmm. Because if Christopher hadn't gone to call Tony, remember, then Adriana wouldn't have been killed. Mm -hmm. If he had gone... He said, I got to go back. I'll be back in a minute, Adriana. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't have to go. Talk. He didn't have to go talk to Tony. Right. He could have just left. Uh, yeah. And then conceivably, they, I mean, the FBI had it arranged to where he would have even had a movie deal. Yep. I mean, he would have had his whole dream to be a, a movie producer, uh, even though he does, in a way, produce that terrible movie at the, in the final season. One which of is my funny. favorite things about Christopher is that he never loses his. His mobness, his mafia ness, even when he's dealing with Hollywood moguls and Ben Kingsley and other people where he should be polite, he is still a hundred percent mobster using his mob to lean on people. To yeah, get he, what he, he wants. threatens Ben Kingsley when yeah, Ben, ben yeah. Kingsley doesn't want to be in his dumb version of Saw. It's basically Christopher's come up with this terrible idea for a movie that's like Saw mixed with mafia. Yeah. <laughs> and that, it's a zombie mobster, basically, uh, which the movie actually does get made uh, in, in the six, the season six is one of the, the funniest uh, comedic elements in the whole show. But he, you know, he, he tries to throw his weight around with Ben Kingsley, you know, and he ends up uh, him, whoever's with him. I forget who it's Polly or somebody, but basically just he punches Lauren Bacall and steals her, her uh, you know, swag bag, you know, of thousands of dollars worth of, of material. Yeah. So uh, that is an interesting aspect to to Christopher that he never. Um, alters who he is mm -mm. with who he's around. Right. 
you know, when he gets around that Hollywood guy that is the screenwriter, you know, the screenwriter starts trying to throw his weight with uh, Christopher. And Christopher's like, look, you owe me $20,000, right? I'm going to give you a week. Mm -hmm. And the the screenwriter guy's like, oh, yeah, you're in the mafia. (laughs) Yeah. A week. Okay, yeah, whatever, Christopher. Christopher shows up a week later. Beats the crap out of the guy, yeah, right? within the inch of an inch of his life, right? Yeah. And then he beats him up again, right? Mm-hmm. The guy ends up getting and then beat he up. ends up killing him. So, so he, yeah. Uh, by the way, don't forget the the sequence in was it season two or three that was great with John Favreau, where you have breaking to the fourth wall. John Favreau playing John Favreau in the show shows up, gets Christopher to tell him stories. And then takes Christopher's stories and puts them into his show that he's making, right? So I'm surprised this, he didn't even kill him for that. Right. Well, he was, I guess, you know, if you're an A-list kind of person like Ben Kingsley or a producer, famous, you know, John, like you're maybe that's a little bit above what Christopher could do because yeah. even though Christopher is kind of a number two or three guy, like yeah. he doesn't have the ability to just go, you know, kill anybody in Hollywood. Like, he's not, he's not that big of a player. He, his attitude is like, you don't know who I am and he'll, yeah. he'll punch anybody in the face. It doesn't matter who it is. It's yeah. So, you know, Christopher does have the, the right amount of balls. Uh, and that's, that's one reason why Tony does like Christopher is that he sees in Christopher that sort of fearlessness that mm-hmm. he has. In fact, Christopher uh, is so fearless that eventually that he, you know, there's a couple times where he snaps and he's ready to kill Tony. You know, you, you, we even think a couple times he's going to, you know, when it comes to the situation where Tony gives Adriana a, a ride home. Christopher is absolutely convinced that Tony slept with her, that they had sex, um, even though they actually didn't because they wrecked. Uh, you know, he comes into the club to bada being drunk, firing off the gun. <laughs> Tony takes him out to outside the city and they're, you know, he's about to shoot him in the head. You think it's all over with Steve Buscemi basically convinces Tony not to do it. And so there's, a, there's two or three instances like this, you know, where, where Tony and Christopher have this, this sort of confrontation and you, you, you really on, you're on your edge of your seat. You don't know where it's going to go. Um, and you just wait, you just wait the whole time. You think Christopher is going to be Tony's downfall. And that was another thing that, that was really good about the show. You keep anticipating, oh, it's going to be Christopher. It's going to be Christopher and Adriana. They're going to be informants. They're going to be flipped. They're going to, you know, go shoot Tony. They're going to go crazy. You know? And no, it never happens. All right. And it doesn't end with Christopher the way you think. Nope. It doesn't you don't happen. expect Adriana to get killed and you don't expect Christopher to die the way he dies. No. <laughs> that was crazy. I know. But Adri- uh, Adriana has the same problem is Carmela because she stays with Christopher because he's rising up and up and up and she's waiting for the one day (coughs) we make enough money he'll marry me we'll move out of this crappy apartment we'll have a house you know all her dreams will come true she's waiting on Christopher this whole time and she could have got out and she has a terrible ending because she put all of her eggs in the Christopher basket yeah and somebody was asking about Lauren Bacall yeah that's who uh to, uh, Christopher punches in the face and steals her swag bag. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there were quite a few interesting cameos. Um, um, David Lee Roth made a cameo at the poker game. Uh, Frank Sinatra Jr. makes a cameo. Ben Kingsley, Lauren Bacall, John Favreau, and probably a couple more. But um, there, there, there are some uh, notable, um, you know, Hollywood cameos. Oh, the Baldwin uh, at the end, oh, when, yeah. who plays Tony in Christopher's terrible movie. That was. Some meta self-awareness. <laughs> that was pretty meta. The, yeah. the Baldwin playing himself in a bad movie, in a TV <laughs> show, right? Yeah. Um. What is this? Uh, ecstasy. Oh, there's an interesting uh, some references to um, when uh, Meadow has her uh, phase of uh, dating. I forget his name, um, and he sells ecstasy. So there's a one of the guys who's trying to work with Tony, who's the son of one of Tony's uh, guys. I forget that guy's name. Um, but Meadow dates him for a while. You think they're going to be together. He's selling ecstasy. And then he ends up dead because he tried to kind of do something against Tony. Um, Tony has him killed. And of course, Tony lies about all the people that he's had killed. And because if, Meadow or Carmela found out all the people that Tony had killed, they would, they would be furious. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, we know Tony has Adriana killed, right? He has Sal go kill, still, uh, go kill Adriana, but he always tells, you know, 
there's always this plausible cover story of, oh, they got killed through, you know, drugs. Oh, Adriana ran off. We'll never see her again. She, you know, she got her feeling hurt, something like that. Um, there's an interesting reference when uh, Meadow goes to college to the Francis Stoner Saunders book that you've heard me reference many times, The CIA and the Cultural Cold War, right? And this is an important book because it shows the role of the CIA and the arts throughout the, the, the entire Cold War period. That book is referenced on purpose, you see. It's not accidental that book comes up because this is telling you that the people who are writing this show, they know what they're talking about. They know this world, this psyche, the geopolitics. They know how this stuff goes down and how it works or else they wouldn't be citing books of that caliber, of that level. It's a very famous academic work about the CIA's role in the Cold War through the arts. And so the uh, in in there's a flyer for this lecture. I think Carmela picks it. Oh, this looks interesting, right? That That's in uh, Carmela, uh, 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 Meadows' dorm room. Um, and so the uh, Saunders is supposed to be lecturing at Meadows College, which is interesting. Then we have the reference to, because again, remember the CIA mafia link, right? That's what this is talking about. Um, we, then we have the references to Sun Tzu, right? <laughs> and there's, a, there's a, a little joke trope that comes up a lot in the show where Tony and his psychiatrist will come to a discovery or she'll recommend a book uh, and then he'll go read it, right? And then he'll say something that she said or he learned in, in, in the therapy sessions to Polly or to Christopher, and then they'll repeat it like it was their wisdom, right? So you, that's how you get son, uh, uh, Polly saying, "Don't you ever read Sun Tzu? Haven't you? Ain't you ever read Sun Tzu?" Which we know Polly is an idiot; he doesn't read books, right? And then you'll get Christopher will say, uh, you know, these tropes too. Like there was some phrase that the therapist told, you know, like a cliche, and then Christopher goes around repeating it, yeah, like it was his wisdom. It's just that there's a lot of these kind of little funny turns of phrases like that, but. Um, there's more seeing of ghosts uh, that comes up in season four. Um, there's a, an interesting sequence where when Tony meets the Mercedes salesman girlfriend and they go to have their affair at the zoo and it's in the snake reptile room. So you have this weird um, Adam Eve symbolism going on here once again, because as you know, this, woman herself is a little unstable we later find out that that well we know that she's actually going to this the psychiatrist with tony right they're seeing the same psychiatrist that's how they meet tony goes and flirts with her and and uh, they start having an affair but then tony realizes that this woman is way unstable and tony being the sort of psychopath that he is like he's bad for her right so uh she ends up obviously you know uh, dying she ends up killing herself and so once again, we see that it's emblematic, it's foreshadowing that that Tony is a bringer of death. He's almost an angel of death. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is a what is a warrior but an, a version of like an angel of death? Right? Mm -hmm. he, he's a bringer of death. Everywhere he goes, right? It's it's almost like he is kind of the serpent, right? And that sequence where they have the affair in the the, the reptile room at the zoo. It's specifically showing you the snake to associate Tony with, uh, you know, the serpent, the woman with Eve, and it's in the fallen state. I thought that was really well done. It's interesting that, that Tony has made it to the top of the food chain in his circles, but nothing he does or has brings him any happiness. Even his gumars, all of them turn out to be a giant pain in the butt. Mm-hmm. So nothing that he has, he can enjoy it. Yeah, you know, all the pleasures end up being pain and punishment. That's mm -hmm. the irony here is that all the things that you think are going to be the pleasures uh, that make you happy but turn into punishments. And that's that's the irony of the hedonistic life. And even in that episode, there's I think it's Polly. There's a reference that's somewhere to predators and snakes. And they're watching a TV show. And, and, and Polly is funny because he's always saying these stupid things that really annoy Tony. <laughs> he's got that <laughs> he's got that laugh that Tony can't stand. The he can't stand Polly's jokes. He thinks they're really dumb. I swear, T. Do it. I'm my mother's grave, T. And then they're watching some show about snakes or something. And then Polly has some funny line about, it's like the snake in Genesis. You know, he starts <laughs> yeah. talking about, it's like the Bible, T. Yeah. 
Uh, but it's actually true what, what uh, Polly's saying. It's, One it's the funny part. Fun fact about Polly is his character, I mean, his in real life, he has um, a rap sheet that was longer than his acting credits. So he was arrested, they say, 28 times. So Polly was a real live criminal. So kind of a real. I don't know if he was an actual mobster, but at least yeah. somebody with a, a big criminal rap sheet. Yeah. Um, and if you watch interviews, I watched an interview with the cast, uh, pres- like it was last year, so 20 or so years after the show. And uh, the funny thing was that um, most of the characters are kind of what you would expect them to be. They're more or less who they are in the show in terms of the way they talk and, and, the, and the, the, the voices and whatnot. Um, but Polly and Pussy are literally the same like mm-hmm. they're that guy mm-hmm. uh, that's really how Polly was and somebody's saying he was really a mobster so I wouldn't be surprised but in his interviews that's how and he, he dresses the same like he literally dresses just like Does that he have guy the, wings? the yeah. white wings yeah I mean it's funny uh yeah he has the same hair he's got the same you know big uh what do you call those 70 shirts with the big these collar Wing, but there's a name for those. Oh, I don't know. Like a wing collar. The oh, big man. 70s one. The fashions in this show were terrible. Like It was like the worst of the 90s. What fashions for women. I don't think I liked one of Carmela's hairdos. <laughs> well, Carmela had the ultimate wine mom Karen at one point. Remember? Oh, yeah. She got the Karen. Like, I didn't think her hairdos could get any worse, and then she got the Karen haircut. I can believe it. <laughs> 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 On my mother's grave, T. Haven't you read Santa Zoo? <laughs> uh, there was a great episode where uh, they showed HUD as a scam. I thought that was fascinating. Uh, if you know about the history of HUD, housing, urban development, uh, if you know about Catherine Austin Fitz, her whole, uh, 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 many of the, the things that she writes about, talks about, deals with uh, scammery and HUD. That actually comes up in one of these episodes with the housing development scam that they um, organize. Uh, they clear out the crackheads. <laughs> that part was pretty funny. Uh, how they hire other gangs to come in and clear out the crackheads so that they can revitalize these houses. But it's all a scam because the houses are like way overvalued for what they are. So it's really just a way to funnel money. It was an interesting scam that, that uh, they thought up. Um, one season, they were all involved in a giant mega building of, from the city, a big esplanade, a new construction site. Yeah, that becomes that. the main um, money-making thing from season four to six, where Tony finally gets in on something really big, right? So this is this is a common theme in, in you know mafia movies, like in The Godfather, where in Godfather 1, they're just a local kind of crime family. Then they expand to Vegas, and by season three, uh, uh, Michael Corleone has gone global. He's making giant land deals that need the Vatican approval. So he's also created a think tank, a foundation, a tax-free foundation, but not think tank, an NGO, a tax-free foundation to hide money. So a common thing in the mob movies is going from the small time to big time. And so this big... Um, water land deal uh the the development deal is a big part of how tony is finally going to you know become a really wealthy person uh, if all of this pays off right so it's all built up to this big esplanada land deal this big development where they're going to make a big it's like a i don't know like a big mall shopping Mm -hmm. plaza uh, right by the water uh, in jersey there um let me see let's go on horse is uh yeah so tony the horse is interesting because tony eventually uh really bonds with this race horse that he bets on her name is uh his name is pi oh my um and uh, the, the the horse wins tony so much money that he buys it and he loves this horse more than he loves anyone else this is another interesting thing where a lot of times i guess psychopathic type people because they can't bond with humans they'll bond with animals uh and so he bonds with this horse <clears throat> and then the horse you got it dies he gets cooked he burns up right? mm-hmm. i mean it's almost like the horse ends up damned so to speak right mm. um just like everybody else that loves tony ends up dead well tony is a bringer of death yeah. and and the, the horse ends up uh cooked literally and this is another foreshadowing obviously of what's going to happen to 
Tony's luck. Tony's fortune, Tony's luck is eventually going to run out. This is why, uh, you know, when he's betting and, 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 and gambling in season um, four and five, he can't lose. Like, he's just, it's a, everybody's kind of amazed at his, like, he just puts the uh, tokens down and, he, you know, he's, he, he wins. And then by season six, we have that important episode where he starts losing and he actually loses a lot of money in bets. That's another thing that's foreshadowing what's going to happen to Tony. Right, this is kind of Tony's. Uh, um, it's the it's the uh, final act of Tony's uh, story uh, by season six. Um, then we have the war with uh, Johnny Sack and all of that. Um, Johnny Sack basically is the rival in the New York family to running things with Carmine Jr. Carmine Jr. is kind of incompetent, just kind of a, a, a goofball. Um, but Tony can manipulate. Carmine Jr. better than he can manipulate Johnny Sack. And so this there's this rivalry, and as we know, it doesn't go well for Johnny Sack. You even think that maybe Johnny Sack will finally be Tony's downfall. Nope, he gets cancer, ends up dead. So basically at that point, when Johnny Sack dies, Tony's won. There's nobody else to even come against or stand against Tony. There's no more rivals. There's no... The battle is won. There's nobody else that can can conceivably take Tony down. But that's what's so great about how he does fall uh, is that it's a random guy you don't ever even expect. It's, it's nobody... Something from his past. It's nobody important. It's yeah. nobody powerful. It's just some really pissed off guy, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see what else. Um, Tony has a really interesting dream uh, where he meets with people that he's killed. Uh, Ralphie, um, Pussy, and he sees the caterpillar and the transformation to the butterfly. Hmm. Um, the, the caterpillar is, uh, I think, crawling on Ralph's head and then it turns into, it transforms into the butterfly. Um, and so I think this is... It's a, if it, it may not directly be an MK Ultra Monarch reference, um, it's possible given the fact that the writers of the show obviously do have awareness of the CIA's programs, the CIA's relationship to the mafia. It's it's very possible that they have a knowledge of uh, Project Monarch. Perhaps there's a, a Project Monarch element to Tony that's maybe not directly being done by the CIA, but then again, maybe Tony is in therapy. Uh, and maybe he's been profiled as somebody useful. Maybe the feds have Tony right in therapy and, and they've organized this, right? That's, that's just speculating. That's never stated. I'm just saying that who knows, what do you think it means that Tony has this dream where he sees the people that he's killed and then he sees the caterpillar turning into the butterfly. Is it a, is a, it is a monarch reference or is it just symbolic? I mean, in a lot of cases in literature or, or imagery, monarchs are just the uh, symbols of people transforming. That they're they're turning into something new. It's the character turning over a new leaf. It's the character, uh, you know, coming to a new phase in his life, right? And this does happen around this time where Tony has his near death experience. Uh, two or three, uh, he gets shot at the beginning of season six. He's uh, in the coma for several episodes. And then uh, the, there's the sequence of several episodes where Tony is in the in-between. He's in this ether, quasi-purgatory, realm of the dead, uh, middle... We don't know exactly where it is, but Tony's having to try to figure his way out of this labyrinth that he's stuck in, in this half-dead, half-awake state. What do you think? Yeah, what else do you got? Uh, this is where we start realizing that the therapy is not really doing anything. Um, the Prozac's not doing anything. The um, Satan. There's some, some reference to Satan, but I can't read my note. There was a Ouija board episode. In yeah, there. but that was actually kind of just a joke. Remember, because they did a, quote, seance, and AJ played a joke on Vito's kid. Mm. Um, no, I can't read that note. Something Janice Satan. Mm. Um, oh, Janice plays the, the Ouija board joke where she, she instant messages the kids and pretends she's Satan. Oh yeah. That was funny. That's what, where Janice is a, a Satan character. But even though it's a joke, what's interesting is that 
um, AJ, Janice, Tony, Carmella, they all sort of exhibit a lot of traits and characteristics of being evil in, in a lot of ways. Not totally evil, but they're definitely an evil family, you could say. Um, Tony dreams that he is the uh, that he's his grandfather looking for work. And, and the reason that I think that's important is that that's kind of hitting at the possibility of this being a Ulysses type situation, James Joyce um, reincarnation. Hmm. Uh, Tony is seeing his grandfather's experience of being an immigrant, poor, with no money, and walking around trying to find a job. Because Tony tells the story to AJ, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's just showing that he is his ancestors. And then who's his ancestors all the way back? Mm -hmm. Well, potentially he is a reincarnated general. Maybe he's a Roman general. Now, I don't believe in reincarnation. I'm just saying that from a literary perspective, this is common in literature. I think it's interesting that Tony's son turns out to be... Um... A sensitive kid and there's no way that AJ could ever take Tony's place he's taken on his depression um, and all of his psychological problems but he doesn't have any of Tony's grit exactly yeah he's the antithesis to Tony mm -hmm. uh, he's the failed uh, um, heir apparent mm -hmm. um, he has no intelligence and he has no courage Right. AJ is terrified. Yeah. Uh, mainly terrified of Tony. Right. Um, and this is the, in the sense in which we see the sins of the father passed on to the, to the child. Because when Tony's in therapy, he bitches about the fact that, he, you know, all the ways that his parents failed him. Mm -hmm. And he's totally oblivious throughout his life to the way that he fails AJ. Yeah. And Meadow. Yeah. Um, next come really important literary references. So we have Heloise and Abelard. Uh, we have... Uh, Sun Tzu, we have Animal Farm being referenced, and Lord of the Flies. And then we have uh, Cold Mountain. So remember, all of the literary references in the show are very important to understanding what kind of a show and what kind of a tragedy this is. Okay, So something like Animal Farm, we know that this is about you know control. It's, about, it's, a, it's similar to 1984. It's, you know, the, it's a New World Order critique kind of uh, you know, work from Orwell. It was very famously printed and published by the CIA during the Cold War. AJ has to read this. Lord of the Flies, we know that's about the law of the jungle versus uh, uh, the law of uh, uh, being ruled by law and order. Right? Is it going to be might makes right or is it going to be uh, a constitution, law, law and order, uh, you know, rule by law? Um Cold Mountain, I, I mean, I, I didn't read that. That's like a boomer mom book. I'm not going to read. But I remember it being about, you know, the Civil War. And it has to do with, you know, uh, dying and love, love death. It's like waiting on... Waiting on a lover. Time. Yeah, so it, that could you, could you could see that as just another tragedy. Isn't it a tragedy? Doesn't somebody end up dead? Yeah. Um, Carmela... Um, begins to cheat or uh, she actually does well they're they're kind of split up i don't think they ever get divorced but she finds uh a guide aj's admissions guidance counselor guy and they have a brief fling and that's where we get the heloise Ab abelard reference um then we start getting uh the references to attention deficit disorder ibs <laughs> irritable bowel syndrome um new uh diagnoses that were new at the time early 2000s popping up once again, uh, Tony has another dream sequence where he sees the dead. He sees Carmine Sr. Carmine Sr. says, I'm worried about the man upstairs. So there's the direct reference to God. Uh, and then Tony, in this really wild, uh, surrealist dream sequence, sees himself on TV as a TV show. So there's a meta fourth wall break where Tony is watching Tony on a TV show. Mm -hmm. And then we see a... Um, Uh, there's Carmela in this sequence is watching a TV show. I forget what it changes to something like France or something. And this pre signifies her going to France. I think, um, the dream is a premonition. Something bad is going to happen, right? So that's what's said in this dream. Then we have the opening sequence. That's very interesting about Egyptian mythology, Egyptology. The seven souls of the Egyptian afterlife and death. Ka, Ba, 
these different references to Egyptology. This is the key to what I'm talking about. This is the, the esoteric significance of the whole show. It's giving you that old school transmigration of souls, James Joyce Ulysses kind of analysis. Again, that's common to the ancient Greek mind. Read Plato's Republic. He teaches reincarnation, transmigration of souls. That's Socrates. That's Plato. That's the Greeks, presumably uh, other Roman literature as well. Uh, probably Virgil. I'm trying to remember if the Aeneid has reincarnation. Probably. Um, it's been a long time since I looked at the Aeneid. But the point is that that same idea is also in ancient Egyptian philosophy and theology. Okay. Egypt Egyptology also has these ideas as well. Uh, I think that's the meaning of that sequence that's really weird where you have the episode that opens with, why would you have an episode opening with Egyptology? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just like, what? Right? Yeah. I don't think most people would have gotten this unless you knew kind of about esoteric type of stuff. Um, <laughs> I made a joke about, or I was thinking of Tony as Dougie, right? Oh, yeah. uh, when Tony's uh, in the dream world. No, it's when he, when he first comes out of his uh, coma, right? When he's had his near-death experience. He comes back and he's like Dougie <laughs> in uh, season three of Twin Peaks. Um, then we get... Uh, the fall of Junior. Junior ends up with dementia. Um, the Junior episode is the key. So let's remember that by season six, we're now starting to get where the whole show is going. Uh, we see in season, uh, uh, actually season six, episode one is the key to the whole end of the show, to the finale and to all of season six. Because Junior with dementia grabs the gun, thinks Tony is an intruder because Junior is basically living in another time. He thinks it's the 60s. And so he thinks that all these, you know, old whatever operations and scams they were doing in the 60s is happening now. This, this uh, mental state of Junior basically going back in time, this is another reference to this whole idea of reincarnation. It's the, the fact that Junior is living in another time because actually the other characters are just... Uh, it's an eternal return. They're representing the tragedies of the ancient world. It's all just recurring. That's the whole philosophy here. That's the Egyptian philosophy, I think. I think that's right. I'm not an expert on Egyptology, but I think that's correct. Um, if, if I'm wrong about Egyptology and the seven souls of, uh, of the Egyptian afterlife and death and afterlife, somebody can correct me in the, in the chat, but I think that's right. Um, but, uh, where was I going with? Oh, so in, in, ep in uh, episode one of season six, Junior shoots Tony and it ends with Tony dying, basically, not totally, but going into this, what you think is his death. He lays there, the phone's next to him. He barely hits 911. And then you, the camera comes down or up. I forget how it goes, but you just see Tony laying there in blood. And then you see uh, Tony laying in the hospital bed. Those are sequences that will tell you in the final ap episode what's going to happen. It's a foreshadowing. It's a almost death foreshadowing the death, you see. Tony is going to die. The begin I think it's the beginning. Uh, this is spoiler alert. The, uh, the finale, it opens with Tony, again, laying in the bed asleep. And some music is playing. Some, some weird music. I forget what it is. Some like goofy organs or something. Uh, that he hears and that's foreshadowing that again that death imagery is like sleep it's just like season six episode one uh sleep and death right all telling you what's going to happen um a couple side points uh there's more literary references here that will tell you that uh tony's going to die um and not just tony but also aj and carmella this is, of course, the disputed point, but I think it's if you if you really think about this, it's not that hard to figure out what's going on. But basically, um, we're we're gonna have to see the death of Christopher first. Tony's got to finally kill off his main guy, and the reason he does it is because uh, uh, Christopher has gotten back into being a, a, an addict, right? He's back into doing heroin. When Christopher wrecks the truck and almost kills them both, it's because he was high. And because Christopher wasn't wearing a seatbelt, which actually Tony had told him, to, put your seatbelt on, right? <laughs> so they roll over however many times. Uh, and Christopher's basically bleeding out. Uh, and Tony realizes that 
he was high. So he betrayed the promise that he would not go back to heroin. So Tony just grabs his nose, right, and suffocates him. And then, of course, lies, uh, you know, oh, it wasn't me, it was the wreck, blah, blah, blah. So now, basically, Tony has committed his final act of, I guess you could say, betrayal. I mean, even though we know that in many ways Tony was forced to kind of kill these people, um, they're still evil actions, right? He's still this bringer of death. Mm -hmm. I think the key to uh, six, ironically, in terms of what's going to happen, there's a couple things that AJ does. Um, AJ says, he starts laying out these weird, this sort of spouting out stuff about geopolitics. It's very bizarre because AJ is a complete idiot. And we think maybe AJ's realized he's an idiot. And so he starts going and reading the news and he starts trying to figure out in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. We hear him talking about, well, I sat in on these lectures about the Middle East. and It's really weird and crazy that that kind of crap's going on. And <laughs> then remember what AJ says. He says, I don't know. I was thinking like I could go be in the CIA or something. I could go like fight the Al Qaeda. And then he's like, oh, and then after that, I could like learn to fly helicopters and I could be Donald Trump's pilot. <laughs> and then Tony's like, oh, is that right? You're going to go uh, be the Donald's pilot, huh? Is that after you go uh, fly over to Iraq and uh, kill all of the Al Qaeda's over there? Like, Tony just laughs at this because it's ludicrous, but there, there's an irony that AJ has actually kind of figured out some of the problem here. And AJ says, America is like this big consumerist thing. And he says, you guys, talking to the family, represent the excessive materialism and consumerism of America. And you guys are living in a dream and a fantasy. Mm -hmm. And so the, the irony here that and if we were to use archetypes, uh, AJ is the fool. Mm -hmm. AJ, Polly, those are fool archetypes. They're idiots. But good literature will usually have the idiot fool character have wisdom, mm -hmm. right? Because he'll have a perspective as an idiot that nobody else sees. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is missing the obvious. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, again, AJ, Polly, the two fool characters are going to consistently have insights. It's like that <clears throat> meme where the low IQ person and the very yeah, exactly, high right? IQ person exactly. have the yeah. same ideas. <clears throat> exactly. Then we see AJ um, taking on these, you know, he gets really into justice and in the uh, geopolitics, the Middle East and all this stuff, which he's not necessarily wrong. A lot of what he, he starts reading about, he's kind of right about. And then he has that big spill at the, um, at Artie's restaurant where he calls everybody hypocrites and he says, Americanism is stupid. It's a dream. It's going to end. And this is right after the big nine event. And in many ways, AJ is correct. Then we have AJ reading the Yates poem. William Butler Yeats, Golden Dawn, BFF with Crowley, the famous Antichrist poem. Now, in maybe in a big, uh, deeper sense, there's a meaning which is esoteric on a in, in, in times level. I don't really think that's what the show is going for. I think that they've stuck the Yeats poem in here <clears throat> because it's the beast that slouches towards Bethlehem to be born is signifying the end of Tony. This is another ominous prediction and reference to the coming death of Tony. Tony is a kind of antichrist. Tony is a kind of um, beast. Um, he's consistently referred to like a beast. <clears throat> the In the apocalypse of John, Nero is the beast. Nero is the Roman emperor. And so in a way, we could almost see Tony like a kind of Roman emperor. And Tony is going to meet his demise, obviously, in these ominous prophetic warnings. Um, I can't read that note. Something versus... Deep pressure. I don't know what that says. Something big is coming. Oh, yeah, that's uh, the, the reference to um, the, the Yates poem is that we get the impression something is coming. It's the end times for Tony. That's what it means. And then we have the reference to, uh, is this the last page? 
I thought I had another page of notes about Tony doing acid. Now the uh, the acid sequence or the the peyote sequence is important because it's another indicator of Tony um, seeing the beyond. So when he goes to Vegas to party and he does peyote, he it's almost like his after death experience where he has this, has this revelation. Then he goes back and he tells the psychiatrist, uh, "You have it in the peyotes." Yeah, uh, I'll tell you right now. This it this here, this ain't all there is. This ain't all there is. When I done the peyotes, I seen it. It's more than this. It's more than all of this. So Tony has seen that there is more than just the here and the now. And so in a sense, again, that uh peyote vision is an indicator of his coming death. He's about to experience and meet that there's more than this. Um, and then we have the important reference. <clears throat> to the CIA uh, working with the mafia in season six in the last episode. I think it's a lot. It's either the right uh, last couple, but the FBI agent that is kind of, you know, talking to Tony and trying to kind of uh, butter him up and, and get some info from him. He says, well, you know, Tony, look, why don't you come tell us some stuff, you know, come work with us. Look, he says, your people hid and worked with the CIA when you guys were hiding Lucky Luciano, right? And so the FBI is consciously kind of drawing on that old CIA mafia alliance. It's specifically mentioned. Does he do ayahuasca or is it peyote? I don't remember, whatever. I mean, he does, he has a serious intense trip that, that he references to seeing uh, the beyond the spiritual world, the afterlife. So, uh, no, so people are saying, yes, I, I, I assure you, if you go watch the show and you pay attention to all these references, you're going to find that this is all there. I mean, they're not just referencing Egyptian, the, the journey of the soul after after death. Uh, William Butler Yeats's Crowleyan poem or whatever. I mean, this is in there on purpose. This is not accidental. They're not constantly referencing the CIA's connection to the mafia for no reason. It's there intentionally. Okay, and I, I assure you, if you go take graduate lit classes, they're going to talk to you about the prevalence of eternal return. If you do Joyce, Ulysses, they're going to talk about uh, reincarnation. So the book's about. So that's what The Sopranos is about. It's an attempt to tell a tragedy dramedy story that's like great literature and references all that great literature. Uh, on all of these different levels and it executed it perfectly. Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, just to, to sum up here as we come to the close, um, it's pretty, I did not look at other uh, analyses before I formed my opinion of the finale. Uh, I watched very closely and I had I'd taken copious notes throughout the show. So I was looking for symbols, patterns, recurring things, clues, and yes, the clue, what did we say? The jacket. The jacket was the clue that Richie, you know, gave to Tony or whatever. And then what do we get in the final uh, sequence as they enter into the diner? The guy in the members only jacket. It's the same gray members only jacket that Gino had. Gino is the guy that Tony screwed over. We know that Tony's going to die because of season six, episode one, which foreshadows the finale. We know that Tony is dying again. Obviously, if you if you read other people's analysis, this became very clear because when Tony is talking to um, who's the fat guy that ends up with Janice, Bobby, Bobby, and they're out on the boat, and Bobby says, "I think it's like uh, you know, you don't hear nothing. You just uh, you go black. You don't hear nothing." And Tony's Tony's sitting there, and he hears him say this, and he thinks about it, and then Tony remembers. Sill explaining that when he was at a dinner and somebody came in and shot the person he was with, Sill says, I didn't hear nothing. You don't hear nothing. It's like it goes black. You you see a you see a flash, a flash of light. And then afterwards you hear it. Mm -hmm. So and the, the way that episode was shot is that the gun goes off and then you hear it. So they want you to have that vantage point that Syl had in that episode. They wanted you to pay attention to the members only jacket. And it's not Gino that kills because Gino commits suicide. 
So presumably this guy with Gino's gray members only jacket, right? That's his brother, some relative that's furious that, that Tony is the reason his brother killed himself. Or presumably he thinks that Tony killed the guy, mm-hmm. right? Because season six, he's he's got all these landmines that he has to navigate. And, and he presumably comes out on top at the end. But he has not improved his soul he hasn't repented of anything he went back to his cheating he went back to lying he went back to killing people um uh yes don't forget too uh polly polly is key to understanding the last episode ironically because polly has the vision of mary in the strip club i say the virgin in the strip club i tell you t i don't tell nobody this usually but i seen the virgin mary i seen her in the club in the bada bing in the bada bing on my life t I've seen it. All right, so he sees Mary, and this is an omen, and it freaks Polly out. Uh, that's not at the last step, it's li- but later on. And then Polly sees this cat, and the cat stares at Christopher, the picture of Christopher in their little uh, restaurant room there. And if, and Polly's really superstitious, and he's like, get rid of that cat. I don't like that cat. I don't like cats. I don't like that cat. I'm going to kill that cat. And they're all like that. And Tony's like, leave the cat alone. I like the cat. Leave him alone. He's just looking at a picture. You're so superstitious. What are you talking about? And he's like, I'm going to kill that cat, T. <laughs> I swear to God, I'm going to kill that cat, T. And the cat walks out and in the last sequence. And Polly looks at it and he knows it's an omen. He's like, something bad's going to happen. Mm-hmm. That cat, something bad's going to happen. I'm telling you, T. Tony's going to get killed. Now, why would there be a sequence of the omen of the cat if nothing bad happens? Obviously, something bad happens mm-hmm. in the last sequence. And when Tony walks in and the the guy who did the show or the, the whoever produced that directed the final episode talks about the fact that they intentionally wanted it to be like 2001 where Bowman sees, he dissociates, he sees himself. When Tony walks into the diner, Tony's standing in the doorway. He sees himself sitting at the other end of the restaurant looking back at himself. The director says, I intentionally wanted that to be like the sequence in 2001 with Bowman, seeing himself in these different phases of his life. Tony is dissociating. He's seeing himself. He's seeing that he's about to die. But he doesn't exactly know how this is going to go down. So he goes and he sits down. The dings of the door obviously are the key. Like these dings have no meaning if nobody's going to get killed. But the ding is telling you that every time Tony hears a ding, he's got to look up because it could be somebody walking in to kill him. This is the life that Tony's lived. Mm -hmm. And so the whole point of the parking sequence with Meadow is because it's telling you that Meadow is missing. Luckily, she's about to miss this bad ultimate end times that's coming. So yes, the guy in the, the members only jacket Gets up, walks into the bathroom. Why is he going into the bathroom? Because what does AJ say to Tony? Tony, he says, Dad, Dad, your favorite scene in The Godfather is when Michael Corleone gets up to go get the gun in the bathroom. That's obviously the key. If you've watched The Godfather, you know it. AJ tells Tony that they've watched the movie a thousand times and it's Tony's favorite scene. That's how Tony's going to die. The guy in the members only jacket is going into the bathroom, just like the Godfather. It's obvious, right? And then, of course, the whole point of the final sequence, obviously, is that it goes black because he doesn't hear it. And he doesn't hear it because of what Syl and Bobby told him. I don't think you even hear it when it happens. You just go black, Mm -hmm. right? And that's why the ding of the door is Meadow not being shot and presumably... Carmella and AJ being killed. So Tony, Carmella, and AJ all end up dead. And it's clear that Meadow has, for whatever reason, avoided this because I don't know. I mean, you could argue why she's not. Is it just fate? Is it just chance? Is it because she was the first to realize it was all a problem? Maybe because she got a a legitimate job and didn't choose a life of crime. Well, there was an, there, yeah, in the last season, there's an important sequence where she gets drunk. Do you remember that? She has her drunken breakdown at when they're all singing songs. Oh, and she at the starts, funeral? 
She's no, they're at the restaurant and she starts yeah, throwing it was things. It's a wake for somebody who died. Okay, but they're at the restaurant. Yeah. yeah. And she's she's throwing things at Junior when he's singing. Mm-hmm. Right? And uh, then she gets up and has her drunk and tell them all off. Mm-hmm. But what she says is true, right? Mm-hmm. So so maybe because she saw what was true and acted on it and she she remember she distances herself. Mhm. She moves out of the house. She goes off. She wants to be at college. She wants to be away from them. She goes to California, but not even because she really likes that guy. It's to get away. Mm-hmm. So maybe she's spared because the impetus for most of the show uh, on the part of Meadow is to get out of that lifestyle and to get away from her family. Even though she loves her family, she knows deep down that this is wrong. They're all wrong. There's something seriously wrong with this family, but she can't get them to admit it. And AJ, even though he also kind of starts to realize this, he's just an idiot. He doesn't do anything to make a change or to get out of this. Mm-hmm. He just is there. He's like a rock. Yeah. So I, th- I think I'm, uh, there may be a couple of the details that I'm forgetting. Um, remember the horse getting burned. I mean, basically anything that Tony does find an attachment to ends up dead. Um, I don't think the bear ends up dead, but the bear never comes back. Um, but there's other clues I'm sure that I'm missing when it comes to um, what may have been the the reason for, for Tony being killed. Uh, some people, I think, speculate that maybe the members-only guy, uh, that Gino had been flipped, um, and that the members-only jacket guy... I think there's, an, there's a statement made to Gino that you're the FBI's top hitter now. So maybe they had turned Gino or maybe this is an FBI hit on Tony. I don't know. Um, You could speculate that. The only other uh, plausible sort of theory is that Tony's not killed. It's just giving you the sequence, uh, the, the, the experience of Tony that at every moment he does fear for his life. I don't buy that. I mean, there's all of these clues throughout the rest of this of the show and season six that are obviously telling you that Tony's killed. I don't, I don't think, I mean, it's ludicrous to say that he's not. What's the point of the whole sequence of Meadow not being able to park on time if Tony's not killed? That's the whole point of that sequence. Mm -hmm. There's there's no other reason for that, obviously, right? Because it's, she's narrowly missing getting killed. She would have been sitting right next to Tony and that, you know, presumably the bullet would have hit her or he would have shot again, all four members of the family. So, yes. Um, that's my analysis. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, it's a, a tragedy. It's a tragedy comedy. It uh, deals with all the big questions in life, all the great big literature questions. Um, ultimately, it's still a uh, pagan, psychoanalytical, Jungian, eternal return uh, psychodrama. Mm-hmm. Um But it's still, if you look at it from a literary perspective and from a cultural perspective and from just as an artistic piece, it's a masterpiece. And it was uh, so realistic that um, real mobsters would watch it and they thought that somebody from the inside was feeding the show information because it was so real. Really? Yeah. Well, as I said, uh, some of the articles I read on it did speculate that it was based on uh, the, the, the Cavalcante family. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm sure, again, I, I don't, I haven't looked into what they were specifically, you know, all the writers were going to, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I'm sure. I mean, it's just like when Mario Puzo did the, the Godfather novel, he went and just collected real stories and just kind of, com- kind of mm-hmm. you know, com- composited it. So uh, I don't doubt that at all. Uh, I mean, we we saw that with Godfather Three. I mean, that the, you know, the Godfather Three gets into the P two Lodge, the mafia, working with the CIA, uh, working, uh, you know, the, the relationship with the Vatican, uh, John Paul the First being assassinated. All that's real. That's all true. Uh, you know, historic fact. But Godfather Three, the movie, even gets into uh, the Vatican banking scandal with uh, Roberto Calvi. There's a character in Godfather Three that's Roberto Calvi. So, mm. I wouldn't be surprised if it, if the uh, the Sopranos wasn't as mafia consulted <laughs> as the Godfather, but I don't know that for sure. All right. So I hope you guys, uh, enjoyed this full on breakdown. I think it, I think we broke it down good. 
I do apologize because I feel like I'm missing a couple details with the finale. I think I've hit all the highlights, though. Oh, the cat. Uh, when Tony walks into the restaurant, that yellow tabby cat that uh, Polly says is an omen, you see a giant yellow cat up on the the mural right beneath where Tony's going to die. I don't uh, think that's accidental hmm. because that's a, that's the omen. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of other details like that. I, and, and I've only seen the show once through. So I would guarantee you that knowing that if you went back, I mean, there's no, you would find, I'm sure all kinds of, uh, you know, stuff. I mean, you could dissect this like you could dissect Twin Peaks. I mean, it, it would be like a, you know, a never ending dissection type of thing. And that's why this does, you know, this is up there with, you know, 2001 uh, with uh, Kubrick, Eyes Wide Shut. It's up there with, um, Twin Peaks, David Lynch stuff for that level of depth that you really can decode it forever. And that's when you know it's something good. Uh, Jack, $5. Congratulations on being married. Um, who's, who's married? Who got married? Oh, you mean us. Thank you. Gerald Norris, $100. Look at that. He said, keep going. Well, you throw me $100, dude, I'll keep going. I will never stop. But hey, it's nice to know that, you know, you could put in this much time and effort to Sopranos. Because what, this took us, what, a few couple months? Yeah, I mean, it, it, this is a couple months of watching and researching and paying attention. So, uh, so really appreciate that, Gerald Norris. That's a really uh, generous super chat. And I really thank you for that. Evan Schultz, $10. He's, oh, I lost it. Where'd it go? If you touch this, it just flies past all of the super chats. Thank you, as always. The Sopranos was a great TV show, and your analysis is insightful. Always nice to have Jamie on. Congratulations and many years to you both. Well, thank you, Evan Schultz. He's a longtime supporter, longtime super chatter. He's been there for uh, what a few years now. So much appreciated, Evan. We know you're a an OG when it comes to supporting Jay's analysis. So thank you for those kind words. And I'm glad you like this stream. Anthony for $10. It's funny my friend watched this series recently. And it coincided with him going through phases of belief in reincarnation. Told you. Uh, his other uh, other beliefs like Buddhism, nihilism, seeing himself as a general. Oh, that was the other thing. Remember the painting. Mm -hmm. uh, Polly has that stupid painting with the horse saved. He saves it out of the dumpster. And then he has Tony painted uh, as a civil uh, as american revolutionary general mm -hmm. once again reincarnation tony is a general would you say that he was programmed that is i think a potential reading that's what i'm trying to say with uh i mean we don't ever get the the clear reference that tony was at some point programmed unless this was all done intentionally and maybe you could say, well, Tony's mom is a psychopath. His dad was a psychopath. Um, so if they had a connection to the feds or to the CIA or something like that, maybe. And maybe that's why the FBI agent at the end says, your family, your people, right? You guys worked with the CIA to hide Lucky Luciano, right? Maybe that's the, the, the significance to that reference. And to the MK Ultra monarch symbolism that is in the show and the Wizard of Oz stuff and the drugging. So is the psychiatrist a handler? I don't think so. But it is interesting to, you know, speculate on is Tony a a programmed kind of assassin? It's it's something you could uh, speculate. But I, I'd have to go back and rewatch the show from that angle to to see if you could really substantiate that. But it's a, it's an interesting theory. Um, so that's what I think about him being programmed. Maybe, uh, Dharma Puzzle, $7, small beer. I know dude, but I is broke. Well, you don't have to, if you're broke, dude, don't worry about sending me super chats, but uh, much appreciated. You want to read some super chats? We're here. Mike, Mike Sherman, $20. Paul went to Norway for a two season mafia sitcom. Hilarious. Maybe he means Polly. Paul Pauls went to Norway for a two-season mafia. He probably means oh, Polly. Polly. 
Hmm. That would be funny to watch. Oh. Yeah. Um, varsity athlete, three dollars. Quasimodo predicted all of this. The elites are the sacred, and we are the profane. Yeah, I mean that's really the 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 basis of all the symbology from the elite perspective. There was a is that a Quasimodo conversation they had. Did, what, oh, did they? Remember, it was like. They were making fun of no trick. No yes, name. and it was right after the nine event, and and Tony was talking to Bobby, and uh, to- Tony makes that. Oh yeah, it's, uh, you know it's like uh, uh, you know the hunchback. No, no, he says the the Nostradamus. Yes. And Bobby thinks Quasimodo is Nostradamus. Yeah. And Tony makes fun of him for being yeah. really dumb. That yeah. part's funny. Um. S. Bad has donated ten dollars. Great conversation. Great impersonations. Forget about it. Tony, forget about it. Christopher. Yeah, that's Adriana. Uh, do Carmela. Tony. Tony. <laughs> oh yeah, she gonna forget about it, huh? Is that, that what you gonna do? You gonna forget about it, huh? Forget about it. What are you gonna do? I like that one a lot. What are you gonna do? Forget about it. On my life, T. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Keep going. Um, Don John. Don John, ten dollars, excellent show. Thank you, Don John. You're an excellent. That's an excellent name, <laughs> Don John. Daniel Enya, Enya, fifty dollars. Oh, thank you. Woo. Great stream. <clears throat> we have to check the show out. Yes. Uh, well, I'm sorry for spoiling it. Although, that's how it goes. If you watch this whole, maybe you cut it off and didn't watch the ending, so you don't know what happens. But uh, I think you will agree with my analysis if you see the end of the show. Okay, Sean. And but by the way, Daniel, thank you for that. $50. Much appreciated. Shout out Daniel and Nia. Sean M. Finnegan, $5. Can you explain revelation of the method and generally why Hollywood does it? Well, uh, on an esoteric level, um, it's done, I think, to just prepare people for what's coming or to kind of cast a spell uh, that you see something before it happens in fiction. And so it kind of casts a spell over you. It might make you... You might be conditioned to it, right? So from a kind of a psychological warfare perspective, it's like gaslighting. So you're conditioned to it. So basically, I think that's the reason for why this kind of stuff would pop up. It's not always intentional. Sometimes the arts just have that quality to them where they can, in a way, predict the future. So there could be a higher level kind of divine providence that uh, is the basis for the arts predicting the future. Sometimes it's human agency uh, that's intentionally um, conditioning people to accept messages. Um, governments have done that forever, you know, embedding messages into to fiction. Uh, I cover that in my books. So, you know, you can have different uh, motivations and actors, so to speak, <laughs> within history. Uh, so it's not always one thing, right? There, there can be different. So, but uh, from the uh, PSYOPs perspective, revelation of the method uh, functions to condition um, and then from the esoteric perspective, you could argue that it's a kind of a, maybe a casting of a spell where you're, you know, um, gaslighting your, your audience uh, before you do what you're going to do. All right. Well, there you go. Uh, two and a half hours. I think we covered it. Any other closing remarks on no, that was a the Sopranos? Super Sopranos stream. All right, everybody. Thank you. If you enjoy this, please like it and share it. Subscribe. And uh, if you do have a chance, um, definitely watch The Sopranos and tell me if you think I'm right or if I got something wrong. Leave me comments below uh, below the show if you're watching this after the live show and let me know if you think I got something wrong. Uh, everybody have a good night and we'll talk to you soon. Next up, by the way, is we will do our top 10 X-Files episodes. Uh, we've, been, we've been for a long time wanting to do a really good uh, X-Files breakdown. So we're going to pick like the top 10 it's going to be difficult. It might not be 10, might be 12, 15, but we're going to pick the best ones we think. I've seen X-Files many times through. It's a great show. Um, the classic for, you know, conspiracy TV shows. Uh, and that will be next up for 